I had a picture that I kind of wanted to start off with. X, open that picture. And I wanted to ask you, where is this? When is this picture taken from? I know what you're going for. Yeah, there was somebody. Yeah, what is this? Okay, so I'm 17, 18 years old. At this time? Mm hmm. I grew up on a little cul de sac in New Jersey. So we're talking like suburbs. I can walk to my little public school around the corner, ride a bike. Um, and in our community, it's pretty privileged mm -hmm. outside of New York City. Um, and uh, everybody goes to college. And it's not like, well, what college are you going to? It's like, are you getting into here, 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 here? And I was a good student. I was an athlete. I had college written on my forehead. And kind of at the last moment, I just woke up and I was like, I have no idea what I want to do, what I want to be. I've never even left New Jersey. How am I supposed to go and like figure yeah. out what to study? And so I just decided I'm going to put on a backpack mm. and go see the world. Yeah. Yeah. And that yeah. was me there. I had a mom and a dad. I'm the middle of three sisters. So three girls. I'm the Miley Kuchori. <laughs> and um, yeah, and that was the beginning of my journey. Kind of like that first step of going off the beaten track. Yeah. Of what's expected of you and what you're supposed mm. to do and supposed to be and... Yeah. Had you had you gone on an international flight before that? Oh no, 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 no. Like my my mom was a nurse, my dad was a teacher but then stay at home dad. He worked nights for UPS. We weren't just your typical middle class. Mm -hmm. We weren't traveled or we spent our summers camping. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. just your typical US American girl upbringing, nothing yeah. nothing fancy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, first time getting on a flight, first time with that little backpack, and the U.S. can be very, um, yeah, very insulated, uh, especially in that community that I grew up in. It was a bubble of sorts. Yeah. And so traveling was such a gift. It was just the world opened up. You realize how small you really are, how how massive the world is, how there's just, there's just so much. And it's such a gift for a young person to get to do that. I feel so grateful. Uh, in this morning when I got up and obviously we planned this uh, day before yesterday and it was such uh, good to meet you for the first time. And uh, we planned this like instantly we planned it. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I was thinking about, you know, like you at a very young age, you left your country and you traveled and obviously at 37 we are here today all the things that you've done in your life all the journeys in your life and it got me thinking about something i'll be very honest with you it got me thinking about a young nepali person who is 17 18 probably leaving nepal for the mm. first time in his or her life going to some other country you know and maybe trying to figure themselves out mm. You know, it, it got me thinking about somebody who is leaving today, Nepal, for various reasons, for various reasons, for probably to figure themselves out, probably because of their family, probably because of uh, the situation in their life, or probably because of education, thousands of reasons, you know. Mm. It, it got me thinking about that, and it constantly gets me thinking about that as well. How does it make you feel when kids, you know, kids who... You've, who practically you've raised them, you know, when they've reached a certain age and they want to go out and explore themselves now. Mm -hmm. How does that make you feel? Yeah, so I, I have 34 children ages 19 to 26. So I'm raising these young adults who are out in the world and getting jobs and signing mm -hmm. lease agreements and traveling and signing up for college and launching businesses. And it's really fun. Um, and I'm also very, very close with the Nepali diaspora around the world. Um, so I understand a lot about the Nepali experience, so gratefully. Um, and I believe that ages 18 to 24 are really transformational in us finding mm. who we are and that time of self-discovery and in our ancient civilizations, we had these like rite of passage moments where you got to like figure out your place in the world. And I think we've really lost it in mm. this culture. And there's so many factors that young people have to figure out. 
Um, so I try to just encourage people to take those steps off these expectations that society layers upon us. Mm-hmm. I mean, to talk about the Nepal experience, it's so different, right? You can't compare a 17-year-old migrant going to work in India to a 17-year-old graduate from Xavier's going to study at MIT, right? It's The thing about Nepal is it's so diverse. and um, But I do believe in this age of transformation mm. and untapped potential, like you can do anything. You can be anything during that time. You you don't have um, the responsibility of family relationships, especially more so as an American. But mm. I, I, yeah, I um I think that that age is really really important, and ugh, anything can happen. And I'm really lucky it brought me here. <laughs> We're lucky to have you here, Maggie. The the thing that I'm trying to get into is, the they say now that the world is your oyster, right? Mm-hmm. They said this before as well, but now in the current age, digital age, the world is your oyster. Mm-hmm. You can do, you can be whoever you want. You can do whatever you want. You can take as much risk as you want. One of the reasons why we started this and we con- constantly talk about this is take risks, talk, express yourself. Uh, there was when there obviously among thousands of things in your school. Obviously, I haven't been there, but I've I've seen pictures and I've seen videos. There was one specific thing that was very interesting. There is uh, Top. I, mm. I, I hope I can call him Dai. Top Dai, and you and you, you're talking about the kids eating in the background. Uh, talk about nutrition. I, I believe you're talking about nutrition. And uh, in the background, there is a sign. Which said, which had a cross, uh, and it said, no bullying, bullying, mm-hmm. something related to bullying. Bullying-free zone. Exactly. Bully-free zone, yeah. Bully-free zone. Mm-hmm. That really touched me. I've been bullied when I was a kid, <sighs> you know? I'm sorry. So, so that was very interesting. I've never seen that ever in my life, anywhere in this country. I might be wrong, but I've never seen that. Your photo. Thank you. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, uh, oh, I yeah, can't there believe you, go. you spotted it, Sanjay. Nice work. I spotted it in the I lo- video. I love, I love that you saw that. Uh, right, I saw it in the mm. video, and it, like you know, just small things matter. Yeah, small things are big things. That's one of my mantras. Uh, mm-hmm. That's a small thing, probably you know, for somebody, but but for me, that's the biggest thing. Uh, mm. Even with education, yesterday what you said, you know, that there's so many different flaws we have, you know, during the uh, during the summit. Uh, could you just elaborate a little bit about that specific thing and then things that you have, like things that you've worked on within the school, within your school system? Let's start from there, if, if that's okay with you. Yeah, okay. So I, so I came to this country super young. My entrance to Nepal was through the migrant experience in India. Then I'm like, I have to go to Nepal. I want to go to Jumla Humla Kali Kot Surkhet. So, so I enter in this space and I come in with fresh eyes because I'm young, I know nothing, I have no solutions, I'm not anyone's daughter, I'm, I, I'm just traveling, looking at it fresh. Mm-hmm. And um, through seeing the challenges that children were up against, it just became very clear to me yeah. that the solution was education. I had a lot to learn. <laughs> but um, then as you enter, mm-hmm. Uh, this country's Karnali region's schools, you see corporal punishment, kids getting slapped, hit with sticks, and worse. Um, You see uh, roofs blown off, textbooks haven't arrived, kids sketching in the dirt, Mm. uh, no water connections. And it was it was heartbreaking to me. I, I grew up going to public school. I'm a product of free public school education. I know I can't compare my experience in America with it's two different beasts. Mm-hmm. But so at first, my strategy was like, I'm going to enroll all these kids who are breaking rocks into school, the kids at the bus station who are begging, the kids struggling with malnourishment, the child laborers, um, the marginalized. I'm going to just enroll them into school. And I thought that would fix everything. But then you realize that the school system is really, really struggling. And uh, so uh, through this process of learning, and of course, I'm learning the language, learning from the people, building a team, 
we realize mm. that it's an ecosystem and it's all interconnected. And if we truly want to serve the poorest of the poor, the most marginalized, the child, the rock breaker, we need to look at the whole holistic picture. And a child needs to be raised in a healthy community. So we think about all of the things that a, a whole child needs to thrive and grow. They need clean water. They need safety. They need um, kindness. They need nurturing. They need love. They need food. They need family support. And uh, we just kind of started reimagining, redreaming. And actually, it wasn't about bringing the West in. It was actually going back to Nepal's roots. Nepal isn't a country of violence and corporal punishment. A lot of that's probably British colonization. <laughs> like, um, so and, and sticks in the classroom. So it was it was funny because we were working with local mm. community. Oh, but this is our culture. We hit kids. We, we when you get a math problem wrong, you get slapped across the face. You this this is relevant. We need, in Kathmandu schools, corporal punishment is still a thing today. Using shame, blame, guilt, insults, and imagine a child being raised, you know, within this system where you're called things like guru or, or, you know, dumb or lata or pagal or... So, so the first thing we created was this concept of nonviolence. Mm. And the next thing we did was really look at ancient ways of Nepal. Nepal is a beautiful country with beautiful sustainable practices. So we started to think about bringing in historical architecture. So rammed earth is what we build our school from. Mm. Um, and it's actually what Nepal's original architecture was, very earthquake safe, sustainable, passive thermal. So we design, we, we worked with all of Nepal's best and brightest architects, engineers, uh, environmentalists. We created a space and then we built the heart from within mm. and kind of set out to prove that we could build the best school in the country that served the neediest. Turns out it's probably the greenest school in the entire world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The highest performing school in our region. We took out the things we didn't like and built in the things that makes Nepal, Nepal, which is actually love, yeah. family, compassion, the Buddha was born here. Nature, like <laughs> nobody's going to come to Nepal for shopping. They're going to come here for nature and culture. Yeah. So it was the concept was, um, yeah, let's build a Nepali school with Nepali values, values through and through, and bringing in the the best Nepali educators and progressive education, but in doing it in Karnali, just to prove a little point. <laughs> Was it, uh, uh, this is a very easy question for me to go ahead and ask, but a very tough question probably to answer. Uh, was it easy? Has it been easy? It, Has anything been easy? No. It was the hardest. I have stories I could probably never even tell. Yeah. It was so hard, so difficult. I mean, I was so young. I have stories that will give you goosebumps in the sense of like, oh, anything is possible. And I also have stories that, oh, my God, like what we had to go through, <laughs> what we went through, how to build that trust, that mutual understanding that this was in 05. So it yeah, was exactly. conflict times. Exactly. Like it was burning tires in the streets, strikes all the time, disagreements, trying to build the constitution, try, trying to find a way to peace, shooting in the streets. I mean, it was a very, very tenuous time in the country. Yeah, We came into Karnali. It's one of the most food deficit regions of the world. 50% uh, malnutrition. We have early marriage. We have extreme violence against women, extreme, extreme poverty, 80% unemployment, migrant the, the way that the whole Karnali region operates is through migrant work. Yeah. yeah. And so we set out to do something very, very difficult. And we proved that we did it, but not without some serious scars. <laughs> you you see all this with, you know, even from the moment we met, you know, you put a smile. There's all this smile on your face, you know. And mm. uh, somebody looking for fire might be like, okay, this is a guy who's going to be I can I, I I I can understand, you know. Uh just just giving everybody a gist. A lot of friends might not have been to Karnali region. Mm. A lot of friends might, who are listening right now might not have been towards that side of town. That uh, sorry, that side of the side of the country. 
uh, it's one of the most pristine for me personally and one of the most untouched place <laughs> in this uh, country. Mm. Very beautiful, very vibrant. First time when I went to Sur- Surkhet, it was, I, I always share this every time whenever I talk about Surkhet that I was in a lot of pain when I was in Surkhet. Uh, mm. I had a, a, a muscle cramp and uh, I went to a hospital and it got fixed instantly because of the doctors and friends who were there who were like, who welcomed we, me with arms wide open and go, I'm a tick one I did so. And so I'll never ever forget Surkhet ever in mm. my life. And obviously other places in uh, Karnali region as well. So it's it's close to my heart. Obviously, you're from there. I, mm. I, and I get to say this now. <laughs> <laughs> it is my home, yeah. How was it first time crossing the border, Maggie, for you? How was it uh, crossing the border and stepping into Nepal? Do you remember that moment? Mm, I I remember it so vividly. So I had been working in India for a year and a half, Mm -hmm. two years. I had traveled all of India extensively. Um, And through the Nepali lens, everyone was following the news and the events, right? Because the borders were closed. Mm. There was armistice. Um, I, I was working with a community that were predominantly migrants and Nepali refugees. So I knew about it and I knew about the beauty. And what I noticed on the India side was this love of country. And you know what I'm talking about because Nepali is abroad. If you find one, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, you Nepal, if two Nepali, it's, it's patriotism and this sense of togetherness and family yeah. that I've never seen before from any other country. Maybe because you all are so small that you have to stick together especially outside in the big, big, you know, in these bigger world. So, so there was this love of country, this heartbreak about what was happening, which I can't speak to politically, and this yearning hey. to come home. And I was like, I want to know why everybody's leaving home, this beautiful place. So I remember I crossed over the border on a uh, pony cart. Mm-hmm. You know them, you've seen them. I think it was uh, Mahendra Nagar. Mm. And came through this country at the time. It was it was less lesser developed, and I remember just feeling the sense of like ease and comfort and safety, and like like you said, just this warm welcome. And I I felt I felt like I was going on this adventure. And mm. I was with a friend, Sunita, my friend Sunita. She was from Karnali. She's from Kalikot, and she wanted to go home mm. and kind of go find her village. She'd been displaced during the conflict, during mm-hmm. the war. And so, yeah, we went out on this journey. And I was young. Like, you know, you're 18, like packing yeah, your yeah. – I'm like all the other backpackers here. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I just remember the bus stopped at the end of the road. The bus driver looked back and was like, this is where you get off. And I had my pack, and I started walking up into the mountains of Dailek, Kaliko Jumla. And that was my entrance to Nepal. So, you know, most people, they come here for poker and Kathmandu. That was my reality, entering in the far yeah. west and coming into the Midwest. Different, different perspective. You knew about Kathmandu. You knew about poker. You read about it. You probably, there was no Google. Uh, well, did you have Google at that? <laughs> no, Google so when we were 18, we yeah. didn't have smartphones. Yeah, we, we didn't, didn't have, have WhatsApp. We didn't yeah. have, so I was traveling like a true backpacker in the yeah, sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but you didn't, like Kathmandu, Pokhara, all these places were definitely there. In oh, yeah, radar. it was on my radar. Yeah, I yeah. just wanted to go to that region because the families that I had been working with yeah. were all from there. Yeah. So I was like, I want to go to Calico. You know, that's where, that's, that's who I knew. That's what I knew. So yeah. that's where I went. And it was amazing. What was the, the the moment that really changed you as a person when you were like 17, 18? I'm talking about that. As soon as you crossed over, what was, what was that moment when you, when you probably met somebody or when you probably like felt that, okay, I'm going to stay here for a while? What was that defining moment for you? Yeah, so there's this uh-huh. beauty, uh-huh. physical, the mountains. There's this purity of life, this sense of what is real that I felt it's resilient, welcoming, all of these good things. But the contrast to that was poverty like I'd never seen in my life, like I had never imagined. Mm. Children suffering from cold, from hunger, um, kids eating mud from the side of the mountain to survive. Mm. I, I saw all of that. Schools shut down, homes, families separated, homes ransacked, temples burned. So I saw these two realities which I think we have to embrace. This is there were these two realities, 
And I'm taking all of this in because you're seeing and feeling the warmth of the people and the beauty of the country and this love mm. that I so admired. And also I was crossing over a dry riverbed. There's so many in this country. And I looked up and I heard this clang, 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 clang. Yeah. And I saw dozens of children breaking rocks. Yeah. And that image, that sound, looking into the eyes of a six-year-old who's breaking rocks to survive, something in me, something happened in that moment. Yeah. Connected eyes, namaste didi. And that was the end. I was like, I want to try to do something here. Yeah. I didn't have the right, the audacity. I don't know. I had, was not equipped. You know, if, if you as a 17-year-old went to America to try to solve gun violence... You know, we have to ask these questions too. Was I equipped to do yeah, that? Exactly. I didn't know the people. I didn't know the culture. I didn't even know the language. Yeah. So uh, something about like my heart was broken. I knew that I, I felt this connection. I mm. wanted to do something, but I didn't know what or how. Yeah. So I went in with lots of questions and I started with the rock breaking community. Who did you befriend at that time? Who was your friend? Who was your first friend? Sunita, so, of course. So Sunita introduces me to her uncle, Tope, who's now mm. my co-founder, Tope Dai. <laughs> and um, he had been an orphan himself. Yeah. Actually, our whole founding team are all, interestingly enough, mostly orphans from that community. And it was 05, 06. It was a rebuilding time, right? Like, the, you remember geopolitically what of was course. happening. So everybody was like excited to come back. There was this conversation around rebuilding. So time-wise, it was actually really a great time. So Tope and I connect. We start building a team. Mm. We realize that we want to do something different. We want to work with children directly. We bring on women. We bring on the community. We build this really diverse group of people with the, with the thesis that change comes from the community and from the people mm. and from starting with the child as the center. So what does that child need to thrive and grow? And then we created an organization. Just, oh, we both invested. I had $5,000 of babysitting money. Yeah. D Tope Dai had $5,000 from working as a migrant in India. So we started small. We didn't go in with big aid, big ideas, big business plans. We're like, we're going to, we draw a little circle around the riverbed. We're going to start with this these girls, this community, hmm. these children. And that was the beginning of the story. Uh, how did the community take it? How did the community take it in the beginning? Like seeing you, uh, <clears throat> obviously, uh, uh, a foreigner coming into the space, uh, obviously trying to help, but uh, I'm sure there were like insecurities right from the get-go. Well, were they? so I think I was non-threatening. I was, yeah, I was yeah. 19 at this point. I'm just, I wanted to learn. I, I knew that I didn't have answers, mm. that I only had to learn from the people and I had to listen. I saw that as my job and I also saw my role as bringing resources. Because a lot of times people know exactly how to fix the problems, but they don't have resources. And that's the one thing I had. I came from suburban New Jersey, yeah. New York. It's seen. Yeah, so, so... Uh, and at first I was like, I could just babysit and figure this out. <laughs> um, so there wasn't any big plans for philanthropy or development or INGO. It was just like, let's create a community project, which was an advantage. I wanted to learn. I, ne I knew I needed to learn the culture, mm -hmm. which is such a diverse region. I had my local team. I had my co-founder, my partner who's from there, highly, highly respected. Um, he's very charismatic, very, yeah. very, very respected. And... Um, that was a major advantage. And I was neutral. I'm not, I'm not political. Yeah. I'm coming in with a fresh lens. I'm nobody's daughter, nobody's uncle, nobody's nothing. So I, in a way, I think in the beginning, I was definitely not a threat. It was just somebody, let's do this together. Let's see what we can do together. And yeah. I think that mentality really worked. And we were super positive. We're optimistic. Anything, we can do this. We can make this place better. And we set out to do it. And it was all like action. Yeah. No talk. We're just like doers, our team. Yeah. Right from the get-go. <laughs> Yeah, let's just do it. Let's just do the things that need to be done. Let's get these kids off the riverbed. Mm -hmm. Let's create a model school that of how we want it to look with our values. Let's, oh, you know what? Like the most important thing for children is women and mothers and empowerment. So that became the Women's Center. Oh, but if kids have these serious health implications, health becomes everything. Because it's a hierarchy of needs when mm -hmm. working with in, in, in serious poverty. 
you can't dream of an education speaking in two, two languages until your f- belly is full, until mm. you have clean water to drink, until you have a roof over your head, until your a parent isn't being abused uh, if, with two living parents in a healthy family. It's all about mental health until you're safe. So, and then you get to education. And we saw that right away from working with this population. Oh, we need to build from the bottom. Mm. Mm. So a lot of the model is a full service community school. We started with water, with nutrition, empowerment, sports, and then like kind of moved up from there. Women as the, as the center focal point. As you kept on moving forward, uh, uh Everything came together, let's see. It, yeah. it, it kept on coming together as you move forward. What I'm trying to track back is, who did you have to convince at that age? You know, Did you have to convince your parents that I'm going to stay here? <laughs> you know, obviously, I'm sure that was like a big, big part of your life. You know, like going back to Jersey, living a life there, your friends. I'm sure high school friends were there, mom and dad, extended family. How did you convince them that you're going to stay God knows, a blip in the planet. Yeah. Like, how, how did you convince them? It was such a challenging time because I had kept pitching, like, oh, I'm just going to stay a little longer. I'm going to stay. And then I'll go back to college mm-hmm. and I'll go get my degree. You know, my mom really, they, my parents were a little um, counterculture. Like, they weren't, like, those parents that were like, you have to do this and checking my report card. But they still had expectations so I'd go to college. Yeah. And so that was a big thing. And then just my basic safety Right. Like my basic safety and security. Would I be OK? So my mom has this line that I think perfectly sums it up. She's like. When I won, we won CNN Heroes. Our name was on billboards and she was like, see, now everybody's telling me what an amazing parent I was and how did you raise such a daughter? <laughs> but if anything had happened to you. Yeah. Anything, you know, trekking through Calico, anything had gone wrong, I mm. would have been called like the worst mother in the world. Exactly. Flip <laughs> side, the other so, side. Yes. I was sending a 19 year old traveling through the, like, like the back country of India into Nepal. And I think back at that time and I was like, mm. that was pretty ballsy. Yeah. Like that was pretty, I think back and I'm like, would I let my kid do that now? I don't exactly. know. Exactly. <laughs> that, you're, you're getting what I'm trying to say, where I'm coming into like, you know, n- like now the kids, again, coming back to the uh, conversation about the kids, your kids now, you know, like uh, not just your two kids, like all, all the kids that you have, you know, like now would you, would you tell them to take that, that risk? So back to what you and I were yeah, saying, yeah, yeah. we have to step off of these expectations, the magic in life, the beauty, everything about my story happened the second I stepped out of the bubble. So we have to say yes, and we can't live in fear, and we have to do the hard thing. You know, there was no reason why I should have been successful, why this organization has grown and flourished. We had nothing. We had nothing. You know, like, but it's almost like because we had nothing, that's what made us what we are today. Yeah. And it's not all Pollyanna- you know, everything ended up great. There was a time where the community was like, we pushed a little too far. Mm. We were a little too progressive. In in Nepal, there's these cultural norms and rules and you start breaking too many of them. Yeah. And that's when things, well, you're fine when you're like 19, not questioning like, oh, you know, but the second you start to push things a little too far, like taking a domestic servant, filing cases against rape, um, questioning Chaupadi as a practice, as an outsider, that's when things get hard. And as mm. an outsider, there was always a fine line. There was always this gray. Yeah. So what do I accept? Because it's the Nepali culture and I'll, this co- I, I, these are the norms. I need to respect this culture that is beautiful and wonderful and, and spiritual. Mm. And what do I stand against? Mm. So Chaupadi is a really good example because... In a way, it's a religious belief. It's something that we have to uh, respect. Mm -hmm. And in another sense, you won't find one of my 13-year-old girls sleeping in a cow shed. I'm not going to sleep. I slept in a cow shed the first time I went to Calicote on Mm. my period. I took the cow urine. I blessed my head. And I did this purification. I thought that's what I had to do. And then... You know, you go through and you realize that people are blaming you for the fruit not blossoming or the snake that comes into the yard. And then I'm like, and the shaman comes and he's chucking rice at your face and shaking because you broke some rule of menstrual 
whatever. And then I started to say, all right, you know what? This is actually misogyny. Yeah. This is patriarchy. This is killing women. This is literally killing women in our region. I have to stand against this. Mm. I'm not going to bow down because it's the culture. Corporal punishment in the classroom, I'm not going to bow down because it's the culture and it's how we do things. This is something I want to fight against. But there are other practices that I really believe are beautiful. And I can't just come, especially as an American, <laughs> colonial savior, and being like, we need, you know, you need to change this. So, so our modality really became that it had to come from the people themselves, not, not me. Yeah. But I had my own run-ins with certain issues, for sure. I'm sure. I'm sh I'm <laughs> hey, Maggie, I'm sure. And th that's exactly what I was trying to come into, you know? Like when, you, when, you, when you're 19 and we've just come here, when you just got here, You know, like like you just said, you you went through all that because you thought it was a part of the system. But once you get into the system and you spend a lot mm -hmm. of time and when you see it from far and when you see it from such close by, over the years, did you take steps, the steps that you took, all right? Mm -hmm. just, just coming back, look, reflecting at things, right? Was it a giant leap and another giant leap, another giant leap? Or mm -hmm. do you think one baby step at a time? How, how, how do you... How do you how do you look back, as let's say seventeen to eighteen mm. years? You know how do you look back now? Just teeny tiny steps forward, backwards, failing forward, mm. keeping that learning m mentality. I'll, I'll never know it all. Admitting to mistakes when you don't get it perfectly right. Yeah. Open communication, really talking with people, having that dialogue, getting people in with us on this journey partnership, true collaboration, but also, yeah, like three steps forward, yeah. back, forward, back, like, oh, like changing your opinion too. Mm. Like it's okay to change what I thought was, was okay. Then, oh, and then you start to question, you start to look at things from all different angles. And that's why I keep a really strong team around me of educators and social workers yeah. and different ethnic, I just, I like to listen. I like to learn. And, and that's how we, as an organization operate just together with this together mentality. <laughs> What is, I could, I could ask you 1000 different things. I, the whole point of doing this podcast is to make sure that the next generation is inspired. Yeah. The risk, what was the moment when you, just reflecting back, I'm sure there are tons of it, but if you just had to pick one, the risk, you know, how do you define risk and the risk, what is one of the biggest risks that you took that you'd want to go ahead and share with everybody? Mm. I mean, the biggest risk was choosing that initial team mm. because that initial team could have been the wrong team. You know, I could have found like some swindler or like this or that, but I don't know. I always led with my gut. Like yeah. when you hear these stories of projects that failed, yeah. it's usually because this fell apart or that fell apart. But my co-founder and I are like so different and so strong as a unit and his family and his children and his wife and now my husband were, that initial team was so strong, but it was also a huge risk of just going in like that. <laughs> like, let's do it. Um, yeah, those those were all risks. Like, just going and doing things in a different way were was a risk. Um, but I have a life now that's just so beautiful and yeah. wonderful, and I love it here. <laughs> and um, it's all turned out okay. I think risks are good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I want a lot of friends who are listening right now to. I always tell them that take risks. You know, take, you, know take, you have to take risks. Do something. I always say yeah. just put that one step forward. Like, yeah, it may be a, a step back now, now and again, and you may need to learn. But by taking no step at all, you're not doing anything. So, like, isn't it better to take those risks and take those steps and find something and dig in? And then you learn, you go on the journey and the the motion starts and the, the synergy comes along. But I, if we all wait, like, I think there's a lot of, okay, I'll wait till I get the right, mm. the PhD. I'll wait till I'm financially stable. I'll wait until I have the right relationship. I'm waiting until I'm more established in my career, until I'm this, until I'm that, until I lose weight, until I'm prettier. Until There's all these excuses. And we're living in a modern world where we're just thrown distraction, distraction, marketing, blah, blah, buy this shit, do that, do this. We have family expectations. But if we just stop for a moment and be in the stillness and really listen to 
the inside of our hearts and what's breaking our heart and what we can do and just that self that mm. the world slows down. We can take a deep breath and we can just see what's in front of us and make a change. And what you do for the world will be different than what I do. And what is going on there and here and everywhere. But as a generation, mm. if we all just took that one step, quieted the distraction, the noise, really thought about this is what matters to me. Because what matters to me will be yeah. different to you. But, yeah. And that's okay. But by finding something that matters, by finding that thing that breaks our hearts, we will make it better. And if we go in with learning and with the right attitude and the right heart and this purity of intentions, it's going to be okay. I truly believe that. Yeah. Because I shouldn't have been okay, but I am. <laughs> <laughs> failures? How do you want to describe uh, failures? Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of one of the first videos that I ever watched. It just popped up on my feed mm. in COVID time. And I still remember there was a video. If I'm not mistaken, X double check this. Garlic is not going to save you. <laughs> I believe something like that. There was a video of you which said, well, garlic and uh, mm. what is the other thing that we were promoting at that time? Ginger. Co- ginger and garlic will definitely not save you. And I was going through that. Oh, this that is, was during the migrant uh, crisis. The, yeah, yeah, this is the uh, COVID time. Right in the beginning of COVID, I believe, right? And <laughs> I think I think so, right? Garlic and ginger, right? That, that's what it was. Something like that, right? I remember I was going through that. Oh, yeah. She's 100% right. One trillion percent right. Even though we had no idea what... COVID was whatever that mm. was at that moment, right? And now, like, uh, we we feel we're feeling as a system again. Not trying to go political here. We're feeling as a we're feeling at that moment. Not just us. Everybody was struggling at that time. Mm. You stepped up. You know, you were stepping up, and that gave a lot of people hope as well. Mm. People, young, especially young people, because I I was reporting at that time. Mm. I kind of, I kind of, I was just following your story as well. I was following what was going on at the time there as well. And then that country was shut. But you're like, no, 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 no. I'm bringing everybody together, at least in my community, at least my circle. And we're going to go and we're going to fight back and we're going to help and support our people who are coming back. You were yeah. stepping up. Because of you, a lot of people step up, stepped up. Hmm. At that moment, from what I recollect from... It was a beautiful moment. I loved that moment. It's one of the proudest moments of my life, yeah. Okay, let's get into COVID. I'll jump back into other things. How, what made you take that step? Like, what goes in, in, in you, like in your heart, in your mind, you know? Without, without uh, Maggie, without... Uh, the worst that I'm looking for is... You, you, you're going to probably gain, like, there's no gaining in this, you know? Mm. There, you're not gaining anything from it, you know? Selfless. Like, how do you do it? Can you, can you explain that to everybody? Okay, so, so I'm, a, I'm a Karnali girl. I work with the people. I, I'm very, very in touch with my community, and I work with the poor and the women and the vulnerable yeah. and the orphan and the widow. That's, that's my jam. That's, that's, where I, that's my spot. You don't see me at things like CNI. <laughs> that's why we've never met before. <laughs> I'm, like a t- I'm there. Yeah. I don't come here. If you see me in the streets of Kathmandu, it's a very rare moment. Yeah. I, that, that's my home. So I'm very, very in touch with that migrant community with, with my region. And nobody actually knows this story. I'm, I'm so glad you asked. So we're watching, and we work with daily wage laborers and um, very, very day-to-day people doing daily, da- daily wage labor work. And a daily wage laborer, they make their three to 400 rupees a day. They go and they feed their family. Well, all of a sudden, daily wage labor stops. Like, you, if, even if you wanted to work, you couldn't. Okay, well, the next way people survive in Karnali is migrant work right? India. India is shut down. Migrant work now stops. We're also in between growing seasons, which is why all of the migrants are, five million migrants are across the border. They need to go get food for their families and send. The average migrant in a, in a season makes about 30,000 rupees. They bring that 30,000 rupees back to their villages, Mugu, Humla, Dolpa, far west, eastern. Mm-hmm. And that's how they subside through, through those times. Well, now that's out, wiped out. We're between growing seasons. The locust came in, wipes out the corn crop. And all of a sudden, we're like, people don't have food. Mm. And nobody's like saying anything. And I, we go into a home, Saksham and I, one of my colleagues, and mm. there's like a woman grinding up chili powder 
to feed her family, like chili. There's literally just chili pepper there. And we start to get really scared and we start kind of gathering food and supplies and the, the supplies are not coming in, everything shut down. So we're scared already. And three weeks goes by, four weeks goes by, you know, you can live off savings for so long. Okay, then people are going hungry and people start to show up at the gates. And like, we're talking pregnant women, women who just delivered babies, their skin and bones have not eaten. At your gates? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, there was no food. At Copilot, like people just started showing Starts up. showing up at the gates to the point where we're like, oh gosh, this we're in a situation now. And I've never seen anything like this. I've lived here 17 years. I've never seen a food crisis like this. Hmm. So I go on to high alert. We start talking about it. We start advocating. We start meeting with local governments. We start, you know, kind of ringing the bells a little bit of like, mm. we're in a situation. And everyone thought, okay, it'll be two weeks. You remember the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be two, two weeks, weeks, three weeks, three four weeks. weeks. Yeah. Okay, now we're into five weeks and things aren't looking good. Then two, three months. So we start this like local food campaign. We source all of our food organically from local co-op farmers. Beautiful. It's called PGS. We have this, we're already sustainable because mm. I told you yeah, we're a yeah, green yeah. school, we're a community-based mm. school. So we've got all this awesome food. We're yeah. giving it to the poor. Well, then the chief minister um, calls Saksham, my colleague, and I in. And we're talking about the food crisis. And all of a sudden, he's like, we've got a bigger crisis on our hands. Right across the border, we had hundreds of thousands of migrants flooding through. But Nepal had created a policy that the borders were shut. Yeah, yeah. So now we've got millions. We've got Nepali migrants walking hundreds of kilometers on the back of trucks, swimming across rivers. Mm. And it hadn't entered the media yet. This was like the first days of this crisis kind okay. of starting to happen. So the chief minister says, will you go have a look at the situation? Huh. And there were these like buses of migrants and people kind of camped out at the border area. And we're at Karnali, the entrance into mm. the region where all of these migrant workers are coming from. So we get in our car, we get a government pass, we drive down. And I swear to God, Sanjay, I have never seen in my life what I saw that day. We had babies on the side of the road. We had children who hadn't eaten. We had young men and women because your average migrant is a young man or woman. We had yeah. old grannies and grandfathers who'd gone over to Lucknow for medical treatment and gotten stuck for months. And that money had just, the, the economy had shut down for two months. So yeah. all of that migrant money had been gone. They didn't have money to get back. They were coming back empty handed and there was no food, no water, we're like walking through the jungle. People are breaking pipes to find water. And I, hunger, thirst, like I had never seen in this country. And I'm just like, as far as the eye can see, we're mm. walking like down the road at the entrance and, and there's, we can't let them in, we can't let them out. And there's no food and there's no money. And they're not even allowed to go to the shop if they have money because the country shut down. And I was like, I call, we call the at the ministry and we're like, this is not looking good. This is not looking good. I'm going to tell you right now, this is not looking good. We start calling everyone just like mm. make food, get food, get water, get everything. And I'm, people are going to die. There's a dead body that comes off of a bus, 18 mm. year old. And, and, and Saksham, he's actually from uh, Lalitpur. It comes from a really amazing family. He went to Ratu Bangla, and he's very proud, Nepali. And we're driving back. We have to go tell the chief minister what we've seen. We're going to try to troubleshoot this. And he's like, this is the first day in my life I've ever been ashamed to be Nepali. Ooh. And then I look at him, and I'm like, we have to do something. So... We try, but it's like drinking water out of a fire hose when yeah. you have thousands and thousands of families and kids and it's life or death. And we're <laughs> calling our local Momo shop, Takali, and we're there making, we're doing everything, chow mein, food, rice, water bottles, water bottles, water bottles. And finally, that night, we feed everyone we can. We get a few busloads huh. through. We negotiate that they're allowed to stay in certain places because no municipality would let the migrants in. That's, exactly. The migrant stigma is for real. I start calling my friends, Raj Gawali, 
been, they all worked on earthquake, yeah, yeah, mass, yeah. mass, mass issues. I'm like, what do we do? What do we do? And we realized we have to change the migrant stigma right away. And so all of us influencers, all the celebs, <laughs> we like started a WhatsApp group, you remember? And I look, so I'm out on the streets that night. I haven't eaten, I haven't drank. This is like day six. Yeah. And, and people are still in dire needs. And like people are so thirsty. They haven't eaten. They're fainting. It gets hot. And um, um, I just say, that's it. I'm bringing it to social media. Yeah. Yeah. That was the moment you were like, all right. And then it went viral from there. All you celebs came on board. And in a couple of weeks, we launched Welcome Home Nepal changed the migrant stigma. It went completely viral. Mm -hmm. I slept out on the streets one night with all of these sisters and mothers and small children. And by the time I woke up after an hour, my phone had like a hundred missed calls. The uh -huh. U.S. Embassy, USAID, UNICEF, Red Cross. By three o'clock in the afternoon, we had a meeting with every single INGO in the country. And we created a nationwide chain to bring home 5 million migrants. Um, young people came out at every border. We geotagged, we had data analysts, like all the minister's kids were in like geotagging borders, calculating how many hundred thousands of meals were needed, how much water, and building latrines, building toilets, mm. rotaries, youth groups. And it just, ugh, it gives me goosebumps. It's like, what is possible? Yeah. Real people. Every influencer, every celebrity, every Miss Nepal, like everyone was just like, this is not okay. And we're going to do better. And we set up quarantine centers. We set up, we talked to mayors. We got soaps. We had like Nepali soap makers making soap in their bathtubs to keep people safe, mm -hmm. sending cotton masks. Kokroma was making baby clothes for all the babies born in quarantine centers. It's the most beautiful 18 years in this country, and it's the thing that I'm like, Nepal's going to be fine. We're all going to be okay. Food came in. Corporations were donating Kit Kats. <laughs> it, like, became this, like, we're all Nepali. Welcome home, Nepal. And the migrants are the ones holding this country up. Yeah. The whole country is being sustained by, you know, like, migrant work. So yeah. where's the respect? Like, where's our brotherhood, our sisterhood? And so the Welcome Home Nepal did that. Everybody recorded videos, and it was beautiful. It became this, yeah, this magical experience. And ever since then, I'm just like, anything's possible here. It's going to be okay. I believe in it. I believe in this new generation. I believe in the youth. I believe in us. I believe in the celebrities here. I believe in... I believe in the goodness of this place. Yes. I stay away from all the other, I stay away from the nonsense and I just focus on what's real and true and the heart and um, the heartbeat of this country. And I, I, I'll believe in it till the day I die. I, 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 whether you're here or you're abroad, being in Nepali is something special and um, we'll continue to, to, to make this place all that it can be. I know that. Well, thanks for putting a tear in my ear again <laughs> <laughs> in two days. Oh. Uh, I said that. I was saying this to uh, my team member yesterday when you were speaking. And again today, thank you for that moment. I remember that because I was reporting it. And uh, mm. uh, Maggie, you're more Nepali than a lot of people I know. You know that. You, I, I said this earlier too, and I'm going to repeat it on air, that you're more Nepali than a lot of people I know. Government about to definitely go ahead and uh, hand you a passport for sure. Oh, can you ask them, please? <laughs> 18. So I'm 36. We're the same age. Yeah. 18 years U.S., 18 years here. So I call myself like 50-50. Yeah. But I'm lucky. It's We're lucky that we have this perspective. And I I always say this is my home, but I'm also a guest here. Mm. It'll, I'll never be. I also, I'm not a Dali woman. I'm, I, I feel awkward talking about it. I, I didn't grow up in Joomla as a farmer, uh, chopping wood. So, so I, 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 I feel it's weird for me to I have to be careful about being a voice for Nepali people, too, because I, that's not my experience. I have to recognize that I am. Well, I'll always be an outsider. I didn't grow up an orphan like most of my children. I didn't. 
I don't know what it's like not to have a f- meal in my belly. So I'm careful about what I say and how I say it. Yeah. But my love for this country is real. It's where my children are. It's a place that welcomed me, protected me, believed in me, voted for me, stepped up for me when I was <laughs> on the side of the road. <laughs> like, yeah. So I, I, I owe a lot to this place. Well, they're looking. They're looking. <laughs> Definitely, the Nagrita is coming, Maggie. <laughs> I'm sure my friends, American friends, might be looking too. <laughs> I know. I, I, sh- I, yeah. I know. I know. Yeah. I won't get it through marriage. I married a Canadian, so I have to. I have to keep trying. <laughs> Trust me, Maggie. It's coming. It's coming for everybody. Don't worry. It's coming. It's coming for sure. The, the, I have high hopes in the at least in the new government. I keep saying that. Try to stay as positive as I can mm. at the moment, and uh, in general as well. Uh, when you, when, a lot of you, a lot of friends, when they look on the left, look on the right, mm. forward, behind, there's a lot of darkness around. You know, there's mm-hmm. a lot of darkness. I'd like to use that word. You know, I was, I was just explaining to Charu yesterday as well. There's a, there's a lot of darkness around. We just gotta go ahead and like look for that light. I was mm-hmm. just, we were just talking about spirituality and a lot of things yesterday, and I was just saying to tell her that look for the light, like whatever the light is. You know. What would you want to go ahead and say to a young person anywhere in the world? Like, not just, I'm not just going to limit this in Nepal, right? A, a 17, 18 year old anywhere on the planet who is trying to figure himself or herself out, you know, like just trying to figure themselves out. What would you want to go ahead and say to them in 2023, Maggie? Do the action, do the thing. You're upset about plastic, pick up a piece of plastic on the road believe in those small actions and the momentum what we've been handed is so unfair there's like so many things wrong but then there's a lot of things to choose from to dig in and 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 do something you know you want whatever you want to happen whatever change you want to see we can realize it but hopelessness and hiding under the covers and falling into the darkness, what's that going to do? Mm. So it's, it's, we have a choice, right? We can get under the covers, curl up in a ball and give up on this place, or we can do something. And each and every day I choose to do something and I struggle with my mental health. I, I like all of us, we're like yeah. the generation with anxiety, depression. Why not? There's like a million, like you said, it's just so hard to find hope. Um, whether you're here or a Nepali abroad, because ugh, these Nepalis abroad, I ugh, the struggle and the grief that they go through, like, and the 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 the, the feeling torn between these two places. Yeah. I, I I have a huge and the judgment of like whether you leave, you're abandoning it, or whether you stay, then you're maybe also this and. <laughs> There's no winning. You can't There's date. There's no winning. If you're a woman, you can't date without being considered a slut. If you're a guy, oh my God. I, I, <laughs> like, I would not choose. <laughs> I, I have so much freedom. <laughs> yeah, like I would not. There's some hard things. I, don't you feel like there's this older way of doing things and then there's this like newer way of coming in, like TikTok generation, and the two of them are colliding in a big way and we're in it right now. I, I, I saw it <laughs> yesterday. I saw it yesterday at the summit itself, you know? So it's like, <sighs> I think this is what happened with our uh, forefathers as well and mm. with our previous generation as well, like in Nepal or anywhere in the world that there's always a divide between the old and the young. You know, there's always a divide between the old and the young, you know? And you and I are right in the middle right now. Like, we're not Gen Z, and we're not that. Yeah, and we're yeah. kind of, like, well-suited to be, like, right in the middle. I think it's great. We are the perfect position. Like, <laughs> if, if we were a generation, like, alpha, like, the next one, or, like, they're calling beta, gamma, whatever it is, there's more, they're more, more shit coming out. <laughs> <laughs> There's like all the alpha, all the what, Roman, whatever, alphabet is like Roman, right? Yeah. All these things are coming out and then we're, we're in the perfect place. It's all breaking though. It's all falling apart and it's all falling into place. It's breaking, but it's not broken. It's, it's a breaking, but it's a breakthrough. And I think we're in the pain of it right now of like, you know, talking about what is right and what is wrong. And, the, and and I think at first you start really polarized. Mm. 
this is right and this is wrong, this is right, this is wrong, this is how we do things, this is how it should be done, no, 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 we're trying. But eventually we find our way to the middle, yeah. which is gray, and where we can talk and discuss and dialogue and debate and bring the older generation to the table and likewise. Yeah. And, and as long as we can have those conversations and be open and be brave and be true, then it's going to be fine. But it's a weird <laughs> You know, it's it's a it's an interesting perspective. Like, I just wanted to uh, let everybody, you know, at least my audience, understand that. You, you know, when you said that the chief minister gave you a call and gave your team a call and said that, the border make pull it out. Just go to the border and just have a look. Like, just have a look. You know, that is that is. I don't know who the chief minister was at the time, but mm. that is the government saying, okay, we're open to ideas. Like, we're open that young people go go look at look at what's yeah. going on. You know. Yeah. I, I, I see that to a lot of friends who uh, listen to my show as well. Like, Prachand uh, uh, coming to this podcast or uh, 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 Kipi Sharma Oli coming to this podcast is they have their own old ways. They've fought for democracy. They've fought, they've fought for what I do here. Mm -hmm. You know, they've, they've practically fought. They've given up a lot, a, a big part of their lives. A lot of people might not agree with this, but this is my own personal opinion. These guys, or Baburam, or anybody who's been to this uh, show, you know, these guys have fought for me to go ahead and sit here and talk on this microphone, you know? Yes. Uh, you agree with them, you don't agree with them, that's, that's completely another argument that I can jump into, right? But at least for this democracy, for, for me to be able to go out and have this conversation with uh, beautiful friends like you, people who are making a difference in this country or around the world, like, uh, so somehow, you know, <clears throat> They are open to dialogue. They're open to listening to what the new generation has to offer. I offered a podcast. I offered this platform so that I have so many different friends listening to it around the world so that mm. they can get inspired or they could get, get something out of it, even if it's entertainment. I have a lot of entertainers come in too, you know, so they'll get something off of this, you know. And I think the older generation is looking at you and being like, okay, she's trying to make a difference. How can we help? You know, mm -hmm. rather than how can we take that away from X, Y, Z? Okay, how can we help? How can we support if this person's making a difference? I think that's what they're thinking now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I want to believe. Yeah. And if they don't think that way, then I sit in this uh, table and I at least there's no point pointing a finger because all four fingers are going to point back at me. At least try to make them understand yeah. that, hey, if you cannot <laughs> say nice things about somebody... Don't say. <laughs> yeah. I also think we need to get more into showing instead of telling, right? Because yeah. I could have, like, said, kept saying, why are we doing corporal punishment? Let's stop corporal punishment. Yeah. And for 15 years in this country, nobody knew my name. I just did my thing. I did my work. Sometimes, like, the local newspapers would come after me and say, she's a Christian missionary. I'm not Christian, by the way. And try oh. to, like, make these low digs and low. She's converting. So, which is not true. And we had our hard things. And we, I've had my issues with every single party where they said this or that. But all of that aside, you stay and you keep in your lane. You keep doing that thing. And eventually, they looked. They walked into that school. They saw that team of all different people from all groups at the table. And they're like, we respect what you did here. It's working. It's magical. So it's slow. And I think we go in wanting quick this and quick that. In the migrant crisis, I was also really mm. uniquely suited because I'm not political. I'm not affiliated with Neutral, the party. Yeah. So I think it was smart. It, at the end of the day, we had every single party at the table. We had the the chief a Maoist and we had a Congress guy and yeah. we were all sitting there just trying to get the migrants across the border and I think we do need more of that of just saying okay look maybe we have different opinions but we're in a crisis right now like we have hungry children yeah. our schools are failing our poverty uh, we've got serious poverty and we have people dying right so let's just do it for the good of our children and and then, and let's all agree on that can we all agree on children well we can all agree on a, on a, on a, that a child shouldn't be by the side of the road. So let's just decide what our common ground is and go from there. And we need more of that. This, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking from, I'm American, where it's like, we hate each other, the right and the left. <laughs> so I, I'm not, not like I have any solutions. But yeah, I do think we just have to like focus on the doing. Yeah. Let's just do the thing and stop talking about it. Do yeah. it. We yeah. don't have the luxury of waiting, unfortunately, because... Mm. 
we've got crisis everywhere we look. So yeah. let's just do the things that need to get done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I completely agree with you on this. And you remember, I, I love looking at like different parts of sock nations. I'll just stick with that. I look at different, okay. different sock nations. I look at the leaders. Like it can be Modi or it can be Xi Jinping or it can be, it can be any leaders, you know. I look at them and how they are looking out towards their people. Like, you know, there's always like my people, my, 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 my thing going on. How is this going on? And obviously with, uh, <laughs> with, the, with the Western world, it's a little bit slightly different. Like it's, it's our planet now, or it can be slightly different too, right? A lot of people have said a lot of things, I believe in this past 17, 18 years, right? How has that affected your mental health? Like not just with the positive things. Obviously, a lot of people say a lot of negative things too, right? <laughs> like you just mentioned earlier, right? So many bad things. I'm sure. Oh, God. How have you dealt with those challenges and still try to be positive? Um, I mean, being misunderstood is never a good thing. Mm. I've always kept my voice and my platform. So the good thing about social, and we came of age during the rise of social media, is like, you speak your truth. Yeah. Okay, they're not going to give you a seat at the table. Make your own. They're not going to give you a voice. Create your own platform. Yeah. Like, oh, you're not listening? Here, I'm a TikToker now. Like, my, I'm friends with Namaste Doc, Dr. Ramu. He's like, nobody knew, nobody knew about COVID. Then all the aunties follow him now. All of my young, <laughs> progressive Nepali women are like, the best thing that ever happened is my mother-in-law getting on TikTok. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, getting exposed yeah. to, like, all these. So Everything. I'm, yeah. I, like, I love social media. I've always been true open, honest, vulnerable, what you get, see is what you get, all of me, the real me. I won't always be perfect. I'll make mistakes. I'll say mm. stupid things. I'll be insensitive. I won't get it right, but I'm, I'm showing up as my true authentic self yeah. and I'm going to do the best I can every single day with what I have with an open heart and honesty. And that's helped me, um, at times when I went through hard things and like tried to take down the wrong people or call out the wrong people, like um, at times when, uh, yeah, someone or this, or, uh, in those challenging times, Saksham said something to me, he said, the, the tree with the ripest, juiciest mangoes gets the stone. Maybe it's a Nepali saying. And yeah, sometimes when you are in your light and mm. in your joy and live, I think it's just you get fingers pointed at you or misunderstandings. So just, I think I always just speak my truth. Yeah. And my truth will be different than yours and it's okay. But yeah. um, all I have is my truth and my own lived experience and that's all I can share and bring in the best people around me. So. You talked about team, right? You talked about team and you talked about <coughs> having the right team right, right from the get-go. <laughs> Obviously, obviously, keep, obviously lucky. I'm sure Very lucky, keeps yeah. on changing, right? W w what did you want to say to somebody, somebody young who's trying to, no, I'm going to jump into thousands of different things. Maybe somebody's trying to open a business. Maybe somebody's mm -hmm. trying to open an NGO or somebody's trying to make a difference, uh, selfless uh, difference, right? Like what you are doing. Somebody wants to probably go out and open a restaurant. Somebody wants to, you know, thousands of things that people want to do, right? What does it take to get the right team? Like how was it back then? How is it now? How has it evolved? Like, what would, what, what's, the, what's the secret recipe, if there is any? <clears throat> I'm a big gut person. Mm. So I always go with my gut. Like, I don't need to see, uh, obviously, we have HR and now. <laughs> At the beginning, we did background checks now. and all of that. <laughs> we have very, very strict child safeguarding and child protection, all, all of that. But my gut, like, when you meet someone and you feel that connection and that synergy, always always trust it yeah i think we need to learn more how to tune in to hear um yeah and values ethics and values that we do i do not bend on certain things it's like no if, if you come into this space yeah. we are children first kids first every decision we make is about the good of the child the family the mother the community so if we're not aligned on certain values that's it yeah, then, then we're not going to work well together, right? So I think not bending on those things that are important to you. Um, and then just slow. We all want it fast. And what's the scalable model? And how will I get the profit? And how will I do this? And blah, 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 blah. We're all about quick, fast, easy. And I'm like, slow it down, everyone. The, things change. It's slow. It's organic. It's holistic. It's not simple. It's like raising a child. You take, it takes 
22 years, yeah. <laughs> like 24 until the brain's fully developed. So just quit the rushing, slow it down, learn, listen, take it step by step. Don't bend on values and just do something. You want to go, you want to outlaw plastic in this country? Mm. Start by separating your own plastic. Do it at home. Yeah. yeah. Using color CC. Do, do the right thing with where you are bef- and then like expand and grow out of that, right? Okay, then I'm going to take it here and then there and then there. We didn't start with thousands of children, right? And the best school in the country. And, the, the you know, 99% of our kids go on to higher ed. And we have these incredible metrics. We started with one child breaking rocks who said namaste didi. And we Ooh. started with one woman, you know, <laughs> one woman and a sewing machine before we trained a thousand women in, in life skills. We started with one brick before we built a school out of rammed earth. We started with planting one tree before we planted thousands, right? So I don't know. I think it's this, because we're in this quick, like the good of social media is like. Fast. Yeah, right fast, away. easy. We have access to all of this information, but also remembering change is slow. It's not going to happen overnight. So yeah, just slow. What I want, I'm not done. I'm not done. You're just getting like, started. I'm still a baby. I'm yeah. only 36. Like yeah. I'm going to, we're going to change this country in our lifetime. You and me and all of us, and I don't care if you're in the UK or Dubai or Australia, our love for this country is going to prevail and we will change this place in our lifetime. Yeah. And we're leaving this place better for our children and our grandchildren. And uh, this will be the generation in our lifetime. I want to be able to look at our grandkids with our gray hair and all of our wrinkles and be able to tell them the time of poverty of an orphan crisis, of violence against women, of, you know, of this place. And then it be in the history because we all came together. And uh, that's, that's what keeps me, that's what keeps me going. Well, I'll have this movie from 2023. Ooh. We'll sit again and again and again. <laughs> this movie. <laughs> They're going to be like, they figured it out. They fixed Nepal on that podcast. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> it was because of that podcast that cleaned up. Everybody just started to green. The trees were saved. The rivers were cleaned up. Everything was fine after that. <laughs> Uh, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. But again, at least you start somewhere, right? Like you said. Sanjay, like 20 years ago in Nepal, girls weren't even in primary school. Yeah. Now, 95, 98% of females are in primary. We haven't seen a Nepal with educated women, with literate women until now. We haven't seen a Nepal where children, yeah, were in school and going on to college and higher ed. We haven't seen a Nepal where young people went abroad and then brought that expertise back. We've never seen it. So we, of course it's scary right now. But we are now. Now we have, it's the first, talk about women, we're in Women's Month. Yeah. We've got a whole generation of girls coming up through the system and women. And it's, it's, it's yeah, do we ha- is it perfect? No. We have to work on retention. We have to work on higher ed. But 20 years ago, yeah. little girls in Kalikot and Joomla weren't going to school yeah. at all. So I'm hopeful. I'm choosing the bright side. The, 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 I, I'm choosing the bright side. You know, I kind of want to give an example here to everybody. And uh, <laughs> yesterday we were, ho- I was hosting the event. I was lucky to host the event, uh, Women's Leadership uh, Summit. A eligible bachelor, a piece of meat. <laughs> up on, I, <laughs> I put this like eligible bachelor up on stage so all, for all of us to look at. <laughs> it was kind of funny. We had this like charming MC Guiding us through, Ooh. yeah, it was funny. <laughs> it was really, I actually uh, don't yeah. know that you're an eligible bachelor. I'm sorry. <laughs> In between things. Now I'm going to interview you about your love In between life. <laughs> one, one specific thing that happened. I, I'll jump into that. I'll tell you. There, uh, I, I, I've had the pleasure of having uh, Bandana Ma'am, Bandana Ma'am mm. here on the podcast. Mm. We were, when she was here, we were talking. About, we talked about like Nepal television, mm. how her journey was back in the day. This is, we we're talking about like eighties and nineties, and when television had started, and education and a lot of things. Mm. 
on the same di- on the same platform, it was fantastic to see her, no shadow of a doubt. And uh, it was great to go ahead and see a young journalist uh, moderating it as well. Mm. You know, there was a young, uh, uh, I don't know how old she is, but it was, it was really very interesting to see in the same platform, you know, mm. like uh, Bandana Mem as the moderator. And after, uh, slightly before that, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, very young journalist as well, moderating uh, a panel as well, you know, so... The shift has already started. You, you're getting what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Like, the shift has already started. Now, because a lot of people are not educated before. Totally. Didn't go to school. My mom had to go through a lot to get her high school done. You know, she had to go through a lot. <laughs> coming from the village, being born in the village in Sindhu Palsok, coming to Kathmandu because her father uh, ran a Sanskrit school there. So he could afford to bring, like, to send her to Kathmandu, went to Padmakanya, studied, had had some kind of education, you know, mm. and then to raise me and obviously my half-brother, and here we are now today, you know, to come coming from all of that, you know. So before her generation probably uh, they didn't get education, educated, you know. Oh. So now, like you just said, 95% are educated, you know. So just imagine what's going to happen with the next lot. With the lot after that, with the lot after that. We might, well, I don't know if I might be alive or not to see that, but at least I'll go happy that the kids are like, the kids are definitely getting the education and taking risks and trying to stay positive, like you just said, Mm -hmm. you know, and you're a role model right there. And so is your mom. Coming back. Mama. Ooh, she she is she is she is and uh, that generation I think yeah. that's what we can learn from I think we need to listen to their stories and mm. their struggles and their hardships and their their pain um yeah I, I think it's important so that we can yeah we can learn from the struggle I feel hope I, I work with 130 mostly women didis and aunties and they say Maggie Keep up the hope. When I was a kid, mm. we didn't we didn't see girls in school uniforms, right? So that perspective is important when the narrative is like everything mm. that's going wrong. Because mm. if we just get all doom and gloom and don't remember like that your mom created the life that you have now, like in one generation, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, I, th- I think we're making these exponential leaps and we know what works now. So we just got to stick to what, what works, what's working. And, yeah. and there's a lot that's not working. We can, we can have like eight more hours on we, what's we, not working. We can. we can go there. Let me know if you want to get a, <laughs> take a break, all right? I want to, uh, just let me know when I'm, I wanted to talk about uh, your experience of seeing, of, of seeing a kid coming to your school for the first time. For the first time. This is probably mm. the kid probably hasn't been to school. Maybe, mm. maybe has never heard about what school is, right? So they hear about it. And then somebody extended family. I'm just like, my imagination is running <laughs> wild right now, okay? Okay. So a kid is, God knows where, somewhere, 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 all right? Somebody XYZ from a family member goes like, Hey, kopi lama padaun cha ni? Jaya pat hai deo nata, bane rai na? So the kid for the first time shows up. What does the kid go through? You know, mm. like day one of coming to yours. Probably the kids never been to school ever, ever, mm. or ever heard about the word called school, mm. right? I don't. I hope that's not true in today's date, but if it is, it is. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, um, one thing when a child comes from a very remote area, we get a lot of high-profile case and placements via the government. But one thing that I remembered when you were explaining it is. Uh, a kid that's never seen a light switch, they'll just sit and just like tuck, tuck, up and down and up and down. It drives my co-founder Tobe crazy. He's like, oh my gosh, this kid has <laughs> light switches, light switches, light switches. Um, they just marvel at the world, a car, uh, a house on wheels and... Um, you know, most of our, a lot of our country is inaccessible by road and they haven't left rural communities. So that's always something that's really interesting. Mm. And, and um, they always have really good dance moves, <laughs> and really good connection to music. Um, food, like a child 
having an apple, an orange, a mango, or when we say like, no, you can eat all that you want. Nutrition is really big. And just watching that heaping plate of hot dalbats and the way that the way that food is um, just so, so oh, such a big issue. Um, and then I think the pride of putting on a uniform and like being a copula, we call it copula for a reason. Uh, just the feeling of a uniform mm -hmm. and the shoes and we even wear ties. Um, <laughs> but just watching that pride or a little girl putting her hair in those pigtails with ribbons for the first time. And yeah, that sense of pride and, and joy. And we really raise our children with being proud of where they come from, proud of their identity, proud of their grit, their resilience. Mm -hmm. We really talk about those qualities. We bring in speakers on those qualities and, and their role models are people of those qualities. And then you build up that sense of safety. A lot of our children have endured trauma. I often say that when a child becomes an orphan or endures in this way, or maybe they're a victim of incarceration, a thousand things have already gone wrong, right? Like we've already failed. So a lot of what we have to do is remedial and really building mm. the basics. So safety is really important, security. Um, we do a lot of work in family development. We've got eight social workers on our team, trauma-informed counselors. So that's really critical. That bully-free zone is for a reason. You know, when a child walks into our spaces, we need them to feel safe, nurtured, loved. Mm. So love is our mission statement because love is everything. That's the most important thing in being human. And so you watch this transformation from a child that shudders when you even put your hand on their shoulder, um, fear, uh, loss, you know, serious things that you and I probably can't even understand in that, yeah. in that sense, um, severe neglect. And then you watch this kind of unfolding, this joy, and children are so resilient. I hate that children have to be resilient, but they are. And we bring in a lot of play, a lot of nature, a lot of music. There's always kites in the sky and games of walnut marbles and uh, swings and earth and uh, toys and joy and a, a safe place to be. And it's all about that. And then they find each other and they find communities and the aunties and our co-parents and our, our amazing teachers and our health and wellness team and our futures team and and then you kind of watch them go through the process. And, and when a child is given that, like a beautiful childhood, anything's possible. Because that's the foundation mm. with which we're all raised. We, yeah, need to be, we need to be raised by a loving, in a loving space, in a safe space. And then anything's possible. They do the rest. Yeah. And then they become doctors and engineers. They're becoming architects. They're becoming teachers. They're becoming social workers. They're going to some of the best colleges and universities. They're doing Votech. They're doing... Gosh, our grads are all over the world. There are many of many in Nepal and doing just so many incredible things. And to watch that full circle transformation, mm -hmm. it's a miracle. Well, I'll add one more thing into it. They can be the next uh, prime ministers of the country. Oh, yeah. I want one, right? <laughs> just one prime minister. Yeah. And, or and the president. Or the but, president. But we also have to change our school system to get that. Like um, this school, our, our, yeah, we, we're, we're preaching on discipline and obedience and putting kids in concrete buildings with ties and we need to kind of like like what the student, what a student needs today to compete in this world, to make it in Kathmandu even, is a lot different than what we're giving them, right? Hmm. So, so that's kind of my next and our team's next journey in really revolutionizing and disrupting education with all the other incredible education disruptors around around this country. Okay, so let's let's dive into that. You want to take Ooh. a break? You let me know. All right, let's dive into this. When you when you were talking about your school, right? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> so we're in Surkhet. We're in Surkhet. It's it's far. It's far, far from here, mm -hmm. where we're sitting at the moment, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Kathmandu has its own bubble. A lot of people don't want to agree with me, but that's completely okay. I used to say this back in 2005. I still say it in 2023. Uh, it's it has its own bubble. We are in a bubble. Probably I am in a bubble. Kathmandu Everybody's bubble in too. a bubble where they live. It's okay yeah. to admit it. It's fine. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, we have our own bubble. I'm sh I'm sure we have our own bubble in Surkhet. I'm sure somebody who is listening to this in uh, other parts of the country have their own, own bubble and their own. They live in their own space. You know. Totally. You've created it in Surkhet. You've created it there. Now, how do we make it? You know where I'm getting into, right? How do we 
even if we can take a little bit of it, not the whole whole thing of Kopila, just a bit of it, just a bit of it, to different parts of uh, the country, maybe within the government system, try to embed a lot of things. How can we make that possible? Because I still remember yesterday, you didn't want to dig into this because you didn't have time uh, in mm-hmm. that conference, right? Mm-hmm. We have all the time in the world here. Mm-hmm. Not um, Again, obviously, not trying to say that you got to preach. But just trying to say, what are the things that we could embed within the school system, government school system, within where you are at? How can we, what can we, what can we just go ahead and infuse? Okay, so I think the first thing is like, let's let Nepali schools be Nepali like truly and in the sense. So <laughs> like what is what are our ancient wisdoms, cultures, traditions that we can learn from and and embrace? Mm. What what was what, let's talk about organic farming. Let's talk about the beautiful birds of this country. There's so many varieties of birds and indigenous plants. Mm. I just learned that the cherry blossom, it doesn't come from Japan. It comes no. from here. It comes from here. So so uh, we believe in this fundamental uh, starting point of place-based learning. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's education lingo, but like w- when we start with school, we start with like all these like big scary things, you know, like <laughs> discipline and sit in your chair and wear your tie and this is how you go to the toilet. And uh, this is what it means to be, you know, a student mm. and be in discipline and sit still. Um, uh, oh, and the world is a scary place and Nepal is a poor country. And uh, I'm trying to think of more examples. There's global warming. Mm. And, um, oh, your mom cooks food in the kitchen while daddy goes to work. <laughs> like, there's all these problems. <laughs> okay, so, so, but what if, what if in the concept of place-based education, we start with what's right in front of us? There's a butterfly There's soil, there's indigenous culture and community, there's elders we can Mm -hmm. learn from. So I I, I think that might might have happened is we went from like, um, we need to abandon our ancient ways to like adopting this Indian British system and what's proper and what's good and what's civilized. And I think we have been, and and there's a lot to be lost. I'm actually a big fan of the unschooled movement. I'm very fascinated with it. So, So there was a lot that was lost in that transition. So what I'm really passionate about is keeping what is good. So my my students, they fall in love with the mountain mm. right there and the community forest that's there. And they interact with the trees and they come to love their place and be proud of their place and learn about the forest and the people and the community and the makers and the honey bee keeper. And we start education from this real holistic sense. And it's actually very easy. You don't need books. You know, you have the community. And you, I believe in schools being the heartbeat, the center, the focal point of a community. It's mm. where children, people, community members, elders can all come together. And we've lost that. It's like become these cement buildings up on the corner where nobody engages or interacts. It's what Rachel Didi was saying yesterday. She's from Teach for Nepal. And no, it, I remember, yeah. Like, yeah, we, we, let's bring, let's engage in our schools and, and talk about what's important. So yeah, we're, we're very much like a little bit counterculture in the way that, yeah, let's do things differently. I don't want to see my students at a desk all day. I want to see them at, interacting with the world and with the community, with their trees, with the local temple or mosque or stupa so so it's it's that the essence of place-based learning and i'm, I'm not an educator mm. I, we have a team for that um but then yeah moving into character and kindness critical thinking we actually shouldn't be like talking at kids at the front of the board we should be listening to them so our teachers do a lot of that of just listening creating space creating room for debate where it's okay to disagree instead of just bowing your ha- hand down and being in discipline and waiting for the stick to hit you when you... <laughs> so it's, 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 it's all of this. Um, our school is made of mud. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's made, it's designed as a vernacular, beautiful Nepali ecosystem. It's completely run by solar, rainwater harvest, 100 different varieties of fruit and nut and indigenous trees and plants. There's birds, there's butterflies. You can't go from one class to the other without going outside. It's a coconut turf futsal field. It's um, it's just beautiful terracotta colors. It's bamboo. Um, 
all made by uh, some of the best in this country, all, all made in Nepal. Mm-hmm. It's one of our, our key principles. So, yeah, just keeping to what's real. And Nepal's got a lot going to it uh, for it. And, and let's not abandon that and build these yeah. cement buildings and, uh, yeah, um, let's just keep it keep it real, keep it with nature. Mm. That's kind of what, what we're about, green school. While you're talking about this, how does it work? How, how does the system work? Like, uh, uh, how is it funded and how do the kids, do the kids even pay something or the parents, obviously, how is it sustained? So we are an orphan care school. Mm. In order to get admission into our school, you have to be um, very, very highly vulnerable based on uh, criteria. Mm. Oh, there it is. There it is. There oh, it thanks is. for pulling it up. Um, oh, you'll have to come here and I'll walk you through. A hundred percent, hundred percent. It's beautiful. Next time I'm in Tokyo, 100%. We'll so, pl- I'll plan it, I'll plan it. So yeah. our architect was Prabhu Tapa. Um, that's a Bari there, represented Ramdor Solutions, Matogar, s- s- some really, really amazing people. Manahar, uh, um, that's a smart Pani design system where we mm. collect rain, we harvest it, we filter it. It, it goes through... Uh, this regenerative process, they created their own water filtration system. Gray water gets recycled, black gets con- converted. Our, our waste runs the Bunsen burners. That's fodder for the cows, which which then generates compost mm. for our garden, which is on the other side of this photo. But the, the milk feeds the kids. Um, the whole, it's, uh, it's beautiful. You live within the system? Within the, so I yeah. live... Um, we're actually expanding up there. Mm. Um, but yeah, I live down, so we run two residential programs as well. We run a women's empowerment center, yeah, yeah. um, and, and that's spread throughout Circuit Valley. We're very expansive, um, in the community. Mm. So, so that's the, that's it. We're called the Blink Now Foundation, yeah. change the world in the blink of an eye. Um, and we're a team of 150. We have small donors around the world. Mm. Actually a lot of Nepal, we have 4,000 Nepali donors, Big to small, um, Kathmandu to the UK, to Australia, yeah. to the US, mm-hmm. to Canada, mm-hmm. um, that sustain this work, that mm. throw in a monthly contribution through, we call it Roots, we're all nature-based. So people donate, a small family foundations, grants, and that's how we do what we do. We're small, we're lean, we're mean, and we've slowly, slowly grown over the years. Um, and uh, we're, we're working and integrating with the local public school system, um, and just getting into the community as much we can, as much as we can, and, and our goal is to to really change Karnali in the next decade. Hundred percent. You were trying to uh, uh, share with everybody how how <coughs> how it works. So when it comes to let's say, a, just explain to me a kid. Okay. How how does a kid get enrolled? Okay. We we'll so start from that and we'll move is, on to this other. This second. is the hardest, most heartbreaking part of my job. Yeah. We'll get it's admission season right now. Oh. We'll get two to three hundred applicants who meet the criteria. From within Karnali or anywhere? Within Karnali. Okay. Okay. Um, so they apply. There's a panel, a very Ooh. diverse panel of Nepalese, all local. So we'll have everyone from the local VDC chair yeah. to the kindergarten teacher to, or teachers to our social workers to a board member. We have a mm. Nepal-based board, yeah. which I'm really proud of. Mm. Um we get a short list, we do home visits, we look at land documents, we look at, we give the child a vulnerability score. Um, you may have heard of ACE scores, it's a, a, a trauma score, a, a score. It, this is really icky, because every child deserves exactly. a quality <laughs> education, but we only have so many resources, and we can only do so much, and we can, we're so full, and we get so many cases recommended to us, that we have to be selective and we have to truly say that we're doing our due diligence to choose the neediest, the kids that will not make it in the school system that need that extra support. Because once you get into Coppola Valley, you get a lifelong ticket and a ride to college. So we're choosing the child that is the most highly vulnerable based on the knowledge that we have, the, the, the most at risk, and we bring them in and then they have everything they need mm. to, 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 to grow and to you know, do well. And we're getting them into top colleges and universities. But for some kids, success just looks like staying alive, not getting married before eighth grade, you know, (sighs) and keeping their livelihood, having a meal each day, because that's the population that we work with. Um, So yeah, they, we select, we get it down and down and down. I can barely go on admission selections anymore because I, it's so difficult for me emotionally. And I've had to work on that. I love children. I live yeah. for children. My face lights up, lights up whether you're rich or poor. or I, I don't care. I love children. So 
it's hard for me, and that's where the team comes in, and then we have to make those selections and those calls. We look for balance. We look for caste, we, ethnicity, Ooh. gender, all of the Jesse indicators. We choose. We turn some away. I've made mistakes. Um, and then th we, they come through, and the magic happens. Yeah. That's the hardest part. It's no good. And then you get, like, the rich people wanting to come to that school. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> So my daughter, my biological daughter, gets a seat. She goes, she's actually in nursery right now. Yeah. You know, and, and we just had two kids from America that did student for the month. And it is truly world class. But this is the thing. Every single child deserves a world class education. Exactly. We're okay. just giving it to the kids who need more of, you know, need that extra boost so that they can compete. And that's why that's my scalability plan mm, yeah. because I, I told I told you yesterday I want to see my children reading poetry winning chess competitions winning the, they are winning the national soccer championship I'm I'm not gonna settle for less because my children come from a poor marginalized background and that's the attitude that we need for every child um, and so our kids they're artists they're musicians they're winning debate <laughs> they're you know scoring amazing test scores if that's a, a thing for them that's important they're um yeah they're poets they're writers they're journalists they're engineers they're mathematicians they're scientists we just try to you know and and you'll never hear like what they have to go through because they're, those are their stories to tell but they have been through a lot yeah in, in order to get a seat at, at in the nursery admissions they have to be an orphan so that's telling you something, and um, but once they come in, it's it's. I'll tell you, it's magical. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm sure. So what we need to do next is um, bring this to every single public school in the whole country, right? And so I've been doing a deep dive on the lowest performing schools in the country, studying them, understanding them with my team, and um, it's not impossible. Hmm. It's totally there's there's a lot of things we can do and we will do it. Uh, just a little bit of fact. Uh, <laughs> just a little bit of fact. So, uh, where are the public schools that we're talking about? Which part of? Uh, I mean, Nepal? everywhere. I, uh, public schools are everywhere. Um, the lowest performing. Uh, if you guys have done any kind of data on this. Oh, okay. Uh, um, if if you have any. Uh, so so the lowest performing schools in our country are generally. Um, government schools, mm -hmm. we are not disclosing our, okay. uh, sorry, not meaning we, but our Nepali government does not disclose data, which um, there is some data. You can, you can look at SEE results and marks and mm -hmm. whatnot. Karnali mm -hmm. is a very, very uh, academically public school low performing, but, but I'd say the theme across the country is that our public schools are struggling, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that. Um, I'm not being controversial, no, no, no. <laughs> but particularly once you get outside of Kathmandu Valley, we've got a major issues with public schools mm. and um, public schools serve our migrant population, our Dalit population, most of our girls um, and most of our children with disabilities, mm. differently abled kids with learning disabilities. So if you truly want to raise up the vulnerable, the poor, wh whatever language marginalized, you really have to look at the public school system mm. and um, and that's where we've got some major, hmm. major mm -hmm. issues. Your kids go to school in Kupla itself? Uh, the, your two yeah, so I have a daughter yeah. and she's in nursery. And she's in the nursery class this year. She's actually going to kindergarten. She has her exam today. I'm oh, like, yeah? Why are you calling an exam? <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> yeah. You call so, exams, so, yeah. So I've always said this is the school mm. you'd want your kid to go to. It doesn't matter who you are. Mm. Why are we accepting that the rich kids get to go to blah, 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 blah. We know all the fancy schools, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And then if you're poor, you go to the school without desks or bench, often without teachers, without toilets, without a water connection. And that's what needs to change. We cannot have equality until everybody starts out in the same place because it's not right. Then what we're going to do is just have this huge divide. We have a digital divide. We have a cultural divide. We have uh, this wealth gap, which is which is a problem. Growing every single bloody day. Mm -hmm. uh, I could talk about this forever. Uh, again, I don't have, ob obviously, coming back to my love life, uh, I'm figuring that out as I go along, but I'd love to have kids. Like mm. I've, I've said this before. Oh, you will. Stop. You <laughs> will. Soon. <laughs> well, yeah. So love you to have, have time. Kids. Yeah. <laughs> so 
So, when I when I hear about obviously my friends have kids, right? My friends are from here. Majority of my friends are from here. Majority of my friends are well, not majority. My friends are all around the world, but some of my friends are here and they have kids. And when I when I when I whenever we meet and I listen to the amount of money they spend on the education, <laughs> oh yeah, it can go up to anything. Like there's no it's it's X amount and then oblivion. You can spend. I can't even tell you, Maggie. Like the amount of you know already the amount of money. That oh yeah, I mean USA ma pani este ho chali sajar dollar, right? Like forty thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars per year. It's the same everywhere, right? It's I'm not talking about in Nepal, yeah, but yes, yeah, it's like, infinite. Yeah, like it's an industry. Yeah, it's it's a complete industry, and uh, so, so, so okay, so till high school, there's an industry here. Right? Yes, and and then obviously we've got the big. I'm not formally educated, so but I've sat down with. Uh, Me neither. I didn't go to college, by the way. There you go. So we're, we're on the same board at the moment. So I've, I've sat down with let's say vice chancellors of uh, the big universities of this country, and and obviously, I try to understand whenever I sit down with like educators is what happens after high school now. What's happening now? You finish high school, and then I'm not trying to say that it's wrong, but. The kids, their parents are going to spend 50 lakhs or a crore to send that kid to, let's say, XYZ country mm. for education. Mm. I know. But maybe not here. Maggie, every single day, even yesterday, I was sitting, even, I, even yesterday, I was sitting down with somebody who, did a, who was an integral part of the event yesterday. And then uh, I, was, I was talking to that person and then, oh, yeah, I'm, go I'm going to so-and-so country after like so-and-so time to do my so-and-so. And I was like, okay. And I was like, so why are you going? Like, you've got such a thriving thing that you've been doing here. And, uh, and the person said, I don't want to name that person. The person said, Mala Pugyo. Mala Pugyo. Mala Pugyo, yeah. I've been hearing Mala Pugyo forever. You, you kind of get me what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. So... We've become, we're, the kids are staying for a certain time and then they want to go out and explore. Again, coming back, I'm not trying to say it's wrong, but we need to make the, other, the education system more strong, maybe, so that the kids want to go out and try and <coughs> see new opportunities here as well, beyond the high school too, which a lot of kids do, but maybe more might want to stay, which might be a good thing, might not be a good thing, I really don't know. What I the future you. is going to lie. Uh, uh, let's let's let, talk about the chain. Let's talk about the chain. So you're really poor in this country. You're a migrant. You're a widow. You're struggling mm. for food. You're a daily wage laborer. Your kids probably n either not in school or they're going to drop out early. They'll maybe make it to eighth grade, right? Mm. And and it's uh, if they get to school, it's going to be their their local government public community school. Yeah. Okay. You're the next level up. You maybe you're a migrant. You're earning in India. You're a security guard. You're uh, you've got an, a relative in Malaysia, Dubai, mm. wherever. Well, you're going to get into that private school. And there's a thousand of them everywhere, right? Yeah. There's like private schools. Some of them are really bad. Some of them are better. But we're talking about like in rural areas. Mm. You get into this private school. It's a thousand rupees a month tuition. You wear that fancy uniform. Mm. And you try to make it up through. You try to get to that SE degree, right? Mm. Okay, next level of wealth a better private school, like yeah. the top names, right? Like next level, next level, next level. And in circuit, we have our tops. Every region has their top schools. Next level, get to Kathmandu. Like the dream of everyone in the West and outside of the Valley is like, Kathmandu. get your kid to Kathmandu. You got your son going to Kathmandu. You've made it in this world, right? Uh, so this is the West. So then you get to right. Kathmandu. And then it's like your next level of wealth, India, right? You get your kid into an Indian school. Mm-hmm. And then the next level of wealth is abroad, right? And then the next level of wealth is the top, you know, top college in a Western. So, so there's this chain, right? Yeah. So we've got the, the, the bottom of the chain struggling to eat and just get their kids in a government, keep their kids in school because they're migrant. School, yeah. And then we've got the top of the chain that's like, get out of the country. Yeah. So everything is broken from the, I don't care if you're at the top or the mm. bottom, it's all broken. So it's... We have to have options and choices for quality, right? So I'm not against these fancy private schools. There will always be an industry for it. Yeah. But it has to be equitable, and we have to have schools that work for the poor as well. And right now our schools are not functioning for our poor. It's not, it's not working. So we can't compete. 
how how can how can how can we compete if we have hungry children who aren't safe who don't have medical services and then if the highest chain the highest point of the chain is just trying to leave the country mm. then we've got brain drain yeah. so we don't have our talent going to these areas and improving the schools and engaging. You know what I think would be revolutionary is if everyone in our generation said, we're sending our kids to the government schools. Oh. If we want to be the change, mm -hmm. let's all send our kids to the public schools. That's how you bring about change. Then you've got educated elite creating, raising the bar and saying, everybody cares about their kid, right? You want to be really controversial? Okay. Let's put our kids in. Let's all put our kids in, in the public school system. Uh, <laughs> you know, in the same conversations, uh, uh, in, in the same conversation, uh, the I wish the government officials at least went and visited the schools first. I tell them. I just just tell them straight. Forget put your about, kid. Forget about sending your kid. I'm just no. saying go and visit first. Imagine if they. <laughs> Everybody should be engaging. Ray Shudidi said this yesterday, and she's right. As active citizens. As got parents, as people who, as engaged, as community members, we should all be engaged in our schools and seeing them as centers for community and social change, right? So we, that's the first step, right? Have, how many of us have been to our local public school? I know I, I hadn't. I, 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 I was so bu busy building our island of Copula Valley, I hadn't been to the school 2,000 meters away and realize that they didn't have water. That's what we're working on now with Smart Punny. So like I was also guilty of that, mm. of creating this island of excellence. So, so the next step is like, yeah, is that enough? No, because the poor kids are in the public schools in Jumla, Humla, Kaliko, Sindupalto. Mm. I'm not even talking about like just far west. I'm talking about from east to west. Yeah, within like 50 kilometers within Kathmandu, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 so yeah. so so that's the first step and decentralization I think was a good thing because then you have engaged bodies and a local buy-in and support but but we have to engage in schools I think. No, that's where the money <laughs> needs to go. No, 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 no. no. I, I I agree with you. The money needs to go to education and healthcare like no no shadow of a doubt on that. Like I've been saying that for the longest time. Education needs every every time I meet an official from the Ministry, I always constantly tell them, let me know if I can help out in any way. You know, any, any, anyway, like if I can help out in any way, if I have time, you know, I'll be more than happy to support in anything you guys are working on. Even if you want to make a small list of PSAs, I do not want to charge anything. I don't care. If it's mm. for the kids, I would not care. <laughs> Recently, a couple of days ago, I, I did a PSA where it comes to uh, not smoking. Like... <laughs> Kids, kids can go and buy buy cigarettes and tobacco in this country. Mm -hmm. You know, easily mm -hmm. it is accessible. That's how I started. Goddamn, sm damn it! That's how I started smoking. No, it's like kind of cool here still. It's yeah. weird. I started smoking when I was fifteen years old. Aww. Fifteen, fourteen and a half, fifteen. I had access to tobacco. This, this man, I'm thirty six now, right? So, till today, it's the same thing. Stop access to tobacco. You might not change this generation. The damage might have been done. You can't change the damage. I cannot change the damage that I've made to my lungs. But the, the generation after that, the generation after that is going to look back and thank this generation. That thank you for at least taking a step. You're getting what I'm trying to say. That's oh my exactly God, yeah. what you're trying to do. They're, they're you know what I tell my yeah. kids? I tell my kids, look, m marketing is really smart. When Coca-Cola couldn't sell alcohol, uh, sorry, when Coca-Cola couldn't sell Coca-Cola anymore in the West because everybody started drinking water and healthy this and healthy that, they started marketing to Africa and, and South Asia. When cigarettes I know <laughs> got a bad into, brand yeah. for cancer yeah. and this and this and this and no, everybody, sales plummeted, they all started marketing to South Asia. And so I always tell my kids, don't fall for it. Like you're, you, but yeah, I, I, we have to, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Let's like just nix it from the whole system and be aware. Small things, like you said, right? You planted one tree and now you're thousands of trees. One <laughs> Woo. I'm thinking about, I was visualizing uh, the kid who is breaking the rock. There's still kids breaking rocks today. Mm -hmm. There's still breaking rocks today that a lot of people in a lot of different parts of the planet mm. will not, uh, in, in different parts of this planet, will not be able to understand or visualize that there are kids breaking rocks in Nepal. Well, probably the next Einstein. Today. The guy that's going to be prime minister could be breaking rocks. The, the woman who 
could be the next health minister who's struggling for food right now. This is all like human potential that we're using, doing labor and across the border, building India's economy, building up Dubai and the UAE. All of our brilliance, our geniuses, our strength, our intelligence, we're sending them to build someone else's economy. And yeah, and children. So so yeah, the future is that. We need to go find those kids, the next Einstein, the guy, the, the guy or gal that's going to cure cancer and, and get them in the classroom and then make sure that that curiosity and beauty and magic within them is harnessed and and that they have the opportunity. But yeah, we, we can't, we're, we haven't been able to figure that out yet. It, 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 <laughs> it's so easy to blame the leaders, but you have, yeah, like you said, we have to reflect back on, yeah, no, re it's reflect us. back, yeah, 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 it's reflect, reflect what, what, back, yeah. Everybody now, what I think is cool, and I see this, everybody's just taking on one child. Mm -hmm. Like the, the wealthy elite, they often have household help. Are we giving them the best education, their children, the best education possible? Are we taking care of our household help? Hmm. Are we Start paying the, them yeah. fairly? Mm. Are we buying made in Nepal goods to support entrepreneurship? Are, what are we wearing? What are we consuming? What vegetables are we buying? Who are we mentoring? Who are we bringing up? To, you know, who are we reaching up, out to and bringing through? We can all do that one thing. The power of every single person in the diaspora just reaching out and giving one scholarship to one kid. Mm. It's not expensive keeping a kid in school, making sure they stay in school, following them, tracking them, would change this country. So, and we are doing that. Everybody's engaged, everybody wants, everybody wants the same thing. There's, yeah. You will not find one Nepali here that's like, kids don't deserve a high quality education. We can all agree on it. So let's just do the act things now. Support the fees, remove the barriers, and everybody take on one child. We, it's doable. Just take the one thing then. We can't change the system. Maybe we, you know, I, I'm not in politics. I'm not going to run for minister. But do the one thing. Yeah. Okay, let's start there. We can't break. Oh, the system has to change. Let us work on the system. In the meantime, can everybody commit to one child? That would change Nepal. I guarantee it. It won't take long. No, no, no. That That one kid will do something. So... They're going to become something. I'll, it's it's amazing. There's demand. There, there's so much to do here. There's this is the land of opportunity right now in IT and in agriculture. There's so much to do. It's gonna it's gonna it's gonna be okay. <laughs> I, know. I know. I know. I know. I know. No. 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 I was just I was just thinking about what the, what the listener is thinking. You know, I'm I'm going. I might be going to Australia soon, and uh, I was just thinking about it. You know, like how. There's always like obviously uh, I was talking to a couple of friends there and and I, obviously I want to meet a lot of the whole reason of me traveling now in the coming years is going to be about catching up with the Nepali diaspora and just trying to understand and uh, I'm going for an event and I was just thinking I, I I was thinking I don't have a lot of time so I'm going for a very short limited period of time because I have to come back and I have a podcast planned and I have a lot of guests coming in. And uh, I was thinking that I'll go a day before and uh, I'll, just, uh, I'm try I'll just write that, hey, I'm sitting in this coffee shop, come on over, if, if, if I'll buy you a coffee if, need if needed, you know, and I'll sit and listen to you. So mm. I'm going to do that in a couple of days and I don't, I don't even know, I've never been to Australia. I'll, I'll put up a coffee shop in Sydney and Melbourne, I'm going to these two places for like three, four days and I'm just like, I'll be in this one so place and let's catch up coffee, whoever comes, whoever shows up. You know, like, it's beautiful. I'll just listen to you. You know, it's not a meet and greet or nothing like that. Like, no, no. It's, it's not a fancy, nothing. Just a coffee shop to show up. Even if one person shows up, one, you know, I'll be more than happy, you know. So I'm just like, come over, we'll just sit and I want to listen to you. Like, what are you going through, you know. So I'll definitely be traveling across the world come in the coming mm. years. And just, just I just want to sit and listen to what they have to, what, what's going on in their mind. You know, not just young, old uncles, aunties, anybody who wants to sit down and have a cup of coffee anywhere in the world. Like if I'm there, I'd love to do that, you know, and then come back and talk about it here. Can I tell you a few stories? There Please. is a guy of course. in San Francisco and he's an Uber driver. He's a Nepali and he's an Uber driver. And once a month, he takes all of his profits from driving that Uber and he donates them to me and to our kids, and to Blink Now, and to our students. And he's been doing this for a long time. Mm. 
you don't make a lot of money as an Uber driver. You know. He's probably, San Francisco's, it's really hard to make it in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. And I think about him all the time. And now he's done it for so long that I know people have been in his Uber and say, I found you through this Uber driver and he was telling me about you. And I, he was telling me about Blink Now. There was another girl and her company was doing a fit competition, like get everybody fit. Yeah. And it was a Fitbit, so you had to get a certain amount of steps every day. And she was Nepali. She's like, I'm going to win this thing. She got up every morning at 4 a.m. to got her steps in every day. She was just like all of it. Was, it was in Palo Alto. Like yeah. Everybody's down here. This Nepali gal's like <laughs> hundreds of thousands of steps. And at, at the end of the competition, she won like $20,000 and sent it over mm. to, to our work. Um, I see a lot of Nepalis, they get their first job, their first paycheck, and they take that paycheck and they hand it right over. And and I've just, I've seen the generosity and the care and 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 it, and it matters, it matters. And uh, every everything that we do matters. Sharing, listening to each other, creating space, giving back. You know, that uniform that, my child puts on that was loomed by the women's center was given by someone, Hmm. right? It was every single building that was built, every single meal that's been served, every single kid in college, every single first pair of soccer cleats that a kid got, every art uh, in an art class. It's been because of radical generosity and and believing and trust that that it, we can do better. So I I believe in it. I believe in us being there for each other. And uh, yeah, I've seen I've seen the good of these people in Australia, especially. <laughs> yeah, New York and everywhere, and Dubai. Our migrants in Malaysia. Are just, I know. I know. It's a weird time, isn't it? It is. It is. It, Never, Meg, I never imagined it to be. I never imagined to sit in this table. You know, mm. never did. I never imagined myself leaving the country either. So uh, I'm not that educated. So <laughs> to to even leave this country, you need to be. You need to. You need to. You need to. You need to get some kind of education. I'm not even that. I got kids working with me in this team who are like so qualified. Sometimes I listen to them. He's a goddamn engineer, <laughs> almost. <laughs> so you know, I feel lucky that I have surrounded myself with a solid team. You know, mm. and like you said, that's the most important thing. And a lot of friends ask me why this podcast has worked. Even yesterday, a lot of influential people were like, a lot of friends want to come here and I can't invite everybody. I have limited time and I can't invite negativity. Like, I, can't, I just can't. At least even with negative people, like I try to see the best in them. Some people have asked me, why did you invite so and so person? Like that person was so negative. Like that person killed thousands of people. <laughs> I'm just like, well, there might be some light in that person. There's something there, you know, mm-hmm. some kind of spark was there. Something was there. That's why I invited and I wanted to find that good in that person. And when, per- when, when a lot of people come, I, even if they're like super negative, I, like some good comes out of it. You know, some kind of perspective comes out of it. And I don't have to agree with everybody to, uh, ag- I can only invite agreeable people, you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's an argument at the end of the day sometimes, you know. And I never expected to do all these things. And now, especially the love that we've received from the diaspora, especially. And within, within, within you know, the podcast is right there. Hey. Um, the podcast, that's why I keep looking at that. It's beautiful. Uh, yeah. and so that's the podcast. We're, the moment uh, I give, the, this was one of the first things I give to be built. Like, I, it's very mm. important to me, right? I wanted a Nepal map behind uh, behind me and so that my guests could see it what 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 they're talking about and what they're talking for is that you know so uh <sighs> all across friends listen to it from all across the world now and we're very thankful we started with like zero right we started with what zero 30 subscribers whatever it is whatever it is and till today i don't even know how many subscribers we have because i st- stopped counting I do it for that one person who's listening at the moment. Like that Uber driver that you're talking about. Probably he's listening right now, you know? <laughs> on his Uber. <laughs> <laughs> you know, probably he's driving his Uber somewhere in, uh, he's somewhere in, let's say, he's somewhere in uh, Alameda or somewhere, and then he's listening to this, and he's like, 
we don't need to know his name. He knows that already. Mm. You know, we're thankful for what he or she is doing, you know. And I'm thankful to that person who who is listening to this podcast till now. God knows how long you've sat down. And I kind of want to go and meet that one person and at least listen to that person, you know, over a cup of coffee. It doesn't, mm. I don't know how much time I could give to that person or to all these people, but at least their stories and come back and then relay it because... Uh, I think all of us were born for a reason. Do you think you were born for a reason? Like, do you think you were mo- you you came to this planet, not just this country, right? You came to this planet for a reason. Do do you, do you think about that sometimes? Like, have you ever has that ever crossed your mind? Don't we have to believe that? If we don't believe that, then what are we doing? <laughs> like, how do we get up and just drink yeah. our coffee and no. get dressed? We have to believe in a purpose. We have to believe that we're here for a reason, don't we? Yeah. Otherwise, what would how would we do all of this? A lot of people, a lot of people don't 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 feel that they have a purpose. So I think, yeah, I think we forget though. I think we get so out of tune with why we're here and the fact that we're only here for a brief minute. We're here for a hot second, and then we're gone. And you and I could both go tomorrow, right? We don't know. Yeah. So, what are we doing with our time? What do we have to lose? Nothing. Which, yeah. So we're going to be dead. Eventually. Yeah. yeah. And all we'll have is this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it, going back to this podcast. <laughs> right? So it's like, I think we, ha- we get so caught up in ourselves and like, oh, this and this and earning and the car we drive and the clothes we wear and the bag. It's just like, none of it matters. We're not taking any of it with us. We don't take anything except for our heart and what we did for those that we loved and those around us. That's all we get is this That's legacy. It. So... I don't know. I'm not into any of it. I'm just like, I'm not biting the hook of what I drive, what I wear, this and this. Today I'm wearing makeup because I was with WOW, but like, I don't, it just doesn't do it for me. I'm like, I want what's real. I want what's true. And the more we can get to that, the more joy and purpose and meaning that we'll find. And I I just, I think we have to stay. That's why I hear you saying like, I just want real stories, real conversations. Like, I just want to sit and, and understand. And that's probably why this podcast is here. And that's probably part of your purpose. Right? I think. <laughs> my namesake, uh, my name is called Sanjay. And Sanjay in Nepali, uh, sorry, in uh, Sanskrit means uh, victory. But uh, the whole point was uh, this thing called uh, Mahabharat. Uh, we have an epic Mahabharat. And mm-hmm. in Mahabharat, there is a... Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a king in Mahabharat called uh, Dhritarashtra, and uh, the king has a charioteer. And the charioteer, my name comes from that, so the charioteer is called Sanjay. So I'm the king's charioteer, but uh, I'm the king's driver. Uh, mm. But uh, what Sanjay also does is, in, in, in the epic is, uh, the king is blind, so the king can't see anything. Uh, so there's a war going on. Somebody has to relay the information to the king. Uh, so Sanjay has this epic power, and the power is called the power of divine vision. In mm-hmm. Nepali, we call it Divya Drishti. And uh, Sanjay mm-hmm. is the broadcaster. Oh my God. Back in the day. Not just to the king, but to the rest of the world. So he can see what's going on. So he explains it to the king and to everybody. So, wow. So, you know, so the more older I get, the more I can relate to my name. It was, it was born to do this, I believe. You know, so wow. I've been doing this for, since a very young age, right? And the more older I get, you know, the more I want to get in touch with people. You know, like I wake up in the morning as, uh, and I'm super excited to meet the guests that I'm sitting with, you know. And I might have to, I might agree with them. I might not agree with them. I might not agree with what they've been doing or what they've done, you know. Like I'm just trying to understand them. Mm-hmm. Right? Without being biased. Of course, there have been times when I've been like, you know, <laughs> like, what is this person saying? God damn it. Like, but, but obviously, that's also a part of that person. Right? So, without, so just trying to relay that. And even with the young kids now who I meet in the street now, who I, who I meet wherever I go, all across the country, whenever I meet them and they're so excited and they're so psyched, I at least try to understand what they, their names and what they do. Mm. And like, even I try to spend like, Two seconds with them, just to just to even shake hands, and just to like you know, like hey, 
Like, you know, what do you do? Like, what's your name? What do you do? Okay, cool. Like, keep at it, you know? And uh, I think I'm, I've, I've, I'm in that position where I can at least relay information. And I try to relay as uh, correct as I can. And both of us try to go out and do that. And uh, I think when you were saying that, like, what I learned from today, like, the, the small little tree, you know, that you plant, you know, which is going to go into a thousand different trees down the road. You know, mm. I think that spark that you have, you relayed that to me today, mm, right? Thanks. And you relayed that to everybody who are listening at the moment, including X right there as well. So it's never going to go away. I mm. think your spark is just going to go keep on glowing and bigger and bigger. And it started from uh, New Jersey. <laughs> Jersey girl. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in Surkit now, but we got to make sure that it keeps on keeps on growing, right? For that, uh, we're not at the end of the podcast. <laughs> what would you want to go ahead and see, say to everybody who are listening? How can they support what you're doing? Not just monetarily, but how can they support you with what you're doing? Oh, my gosh. Um, follow us on social. Share the yeah. message of children. We can all. Children need to be safe, educated, loved. We're looking for mentors. Celebrities, I want to say use your platforms. Kids are watching you now. Even in Carnali, they have these smartphones. I swear, everybody's watching. So The kids are? The kids, everybody the kids are? is watching. Look at the data. TikTok, of, everything? Yes, there is. There are, there, this is a TikTok nation. <laughs> everybody's <laughs> watching. People are watching. They're listening. Um... What you can do for, for us, keep children at the center, mentor, lead, guide. Um, I'm always looking for speakers. I'm looking for a team. We're really growing and expanding our team. Follow, follow along on our journey at blinknow.org, on our, our socials. Um, I have a book coming out. Yeah, I want to talk about In Nepal, that. at the end of this month, our launch date is April 28th. Mm -hmm. It's a memoir, it's a story, it's a love letter to Nepal. It's all the truth, the, the ugly, the good, the bad. Um, and I hope that it resonates with people. Um, I'd love for people to read and support the book. Um, What's the book called? Between the Mountain and the Sky. And it's coming out, uh, A Mother's Story of uh, Love, and, love hope. and Hope. When's it coming out here? April 28th, it'll be in stores. I'm repped with Coyote's Cove. Um, got a woman publisher, small business. It'll be in bookstores throughout throughout the country. Yeah, it'll be in Nepali. And Nepal, yeah, that's what I was coming. It's gonna be in Nepali, it's gonna be and, Nepali English. and English. Oh, and the uh -huh. proceeds of the book uh, also support and go back into our organization. Um, so I hope people read. I think you'll find is a it, lot uh, of there. It is between the mountain and the sky. Um, that's that's my book. I'm holding a child, and, and it's my side profile, and I'm holding um, one of my kids, one of my boys, with the mountain in the background. And it's where I fell in love with Nepal, the mountain in the sky. Yeah. So there's a lot of truth in there. There's mm. a lot of beauty. There's a lot of, yeah. It's, it's, I entered the book with all the questions that I had mm. that I'm still grappling with, and I looked for answers in, in writing it and I, I needed to do a lot of healing as well and I tried to do it within those pages I wrote it over COVID actually right after the migrant crisis mm. taking all of that in I, I hadn't stopped I hadn't I, I just I hadn't, hadn't slept and I, I came back I was isolated in Canada in a small cabin in the woods and then a lot of that book came together there interesting yeah so I hope people like it it's another way to support and if not with Blink Now and, and Copula Valley there are so many, find those projects that resonate with you. Find them. Just find something and dig in and get involved. Interesting. It's very interesting. And I, I kind of want to tell everybody, I'm going to, I love, I love that side of the uh, country very much. And uh, I try to, again, obviously, this, is, this might sound a little bit different, but I try to go to at least Bordia, at least, at least find to Bordia every yeah. single year. Haven't been... Uh, haven't been uh, last year. I just couldn't uh, go. So this year we're, we're going to Bordea. Me and a couple of my friends were going to Bordea yeah. as always and love Bordea. Love it, it, that site. I really love that site. And me and my brother, we're, we're riding a motorcycle. So I kind of wanted to tell you um, <laughs> on air itself. We're, we're doing a motorcycle trip. Uh, we did a motorcycle trip towards the other side. So we're doing a motorcycle trip, me and my brother, to it this year. 
and we'd love to come if come. Uh, we'd love to come for that'd be so day. fun oh i can't wait yeah, yeah come on out we'll 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 go all the way to the border so we definitely want to do that maybe cross over too so we'd love to come we'll spend uh, some time and uh, if, come if that's okay that. with you yes 100%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah come talk to the kids come meet them they'd, they'd love that you've got a lot of fans out there hey yo we got fans <laughs> bro <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I love that. Come um, see it all. Come will, see it. Yeah. We will. We will. We will. I love that. I think that's a really important message for our Nepali listeners too. It's like travel this country, right? Like every district you go to, it's so completely different. It is. There's so much to see, right? Like even I haven't been to Rara yet. I, uh, there's so many places. I'm like a not. I've lived here for 18 years. I've yeah. never gone really trekking. You haven't. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Dude, you had a backpack. Hey. <laughs> I guess it counts if it counts. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, your backpack was all the my backpack. I guess it ca- I've like never done trekking in the sense where you like get the shoes and the sleeping bag and the gear. But I, I have I have traveled. I've gone to every village and all over Karnali. Yeah, but yeah. it's don't you get something every time? There's oh, there's so much richness and and we have to travel this country. I love that you're going on a motorbike ride across the country. That's beautiful. We need more of that. Mm-hmm. The The whole idea is, <clears throat> since we're talking about this, the whole idea is we do a thousand podcasts, right, X? We do a thousand podcasts, whenever that is. I don't even know whenever we finish that. Sit down with 1,000 people and take a year off. So kind of want to take a year off. Uh, I kind of want to walk as much as I can. Uh, walk, bus, whatever it is. Mm. Whatever. I don't I really don't care. So we kind of want to go. We kind of want to go all the way there. Uh, I don't know. Still have part. I don't know what's gonna happen by the time we finish one thousand podcasts. We'll probably hopefully have the whole thing. So we do the whole thing. So we wanna kind of want to walk. We'll come to Surkhet too. We will walk the whole thing as much as we can for like a I don't know a year. That's the plan, right? That's the plan. Walk around, document travel. a lot of things, travel. We we'll just walk around. I got this idea from uh, Amrit Gurung. He is the mm. uh, uh, the lead man of this band called Nepathia. And uh, I went to the concert. You did. You did. <laughs> I was right there dancing in the front yeah, row. There, oh my god! I bought like so many tickets. My all of my kids. Were, oh my god! Of course. <laughs> that's awesome. So, that's yeah. awesome. Yes, he's a gem of a guy. <laughs> and when he was here, and it kind of hit me really hard that I talk about a lot of things, and I'm a Kathmandu boy. And I really haven't seen the country, and um, I've I've seen the world. I'm mm-hmm. not gonna lie to you. I've, I've I'm blessed. Uh, I've I've seen the U.S. thoroughly. You know, I've been to so many different states. Did a movie there. I've I've, I've been to so many different parts of the planet, and I actually haven't seen Nepal, the country that I was born in, all properly. Right. And we're just like, all right, let's 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 get to a purpose. At least we're trying to do this, and then we'll take this on the road, and we will sit down and we'll document it. Uh, we'll document our 365 days. Travel across and meet a lot of friends. I love this for you. <laughs> I get to do this, so, you know. <laughs> this is this is awesome. And, I'm excited for and, this. Uh, come in and we will sit and chat. Uh, where are you at? You know, I'll come to you. You know, and just walk, just meet a lot of people, and get to do this. So we, we, we're playing that in a couple of years, and I'm I'm here to stay. Like I, I ain't got more like the soccer at China. Yeah, you are. You ain't new. But that means you're not Pukio. <laughs> Koilibani, never, never. It's never, <laughs> never. God damn it. It's like for you as well. It's never. book then. No, people say, when's your plan? When does your project phase out? I'm like, I'm re- I have a two year old here. Like, I'm, I'm going to be here for good. No, and, and yeah, if we're lucky enough. We'll be here for a long time. So yeah. So yeah. No, I'm 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 in it to stay too. This is a lifelong project, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we're lucky we get to choose, right? Like, we lo- we're lucky we get. Yeah, I, I, it, it, it's it's a privilege as well. So, I, I, yeah, I, I love that you recognize that, and 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 I do too. I um, oftentimes when I'm working with our our aunties and and didis, mm. they'll be like, Maggie, you're such a man. You're so smart. You're so strong. You're so mm. spe- you're this. You're that. And I'm like, no, no, no. I, I drive. I drive like a truck in Nepal which I'm the only female driver that I've seen, that I know of, in, of, of a vehicle. Um, we don't even have women riding motorbikes yet. Now scooters are coming in. But how can you drive? Like, you're so this, that, blah, blah. 
And I'm like, Didi, if you grew up where I grew up, you would drive too. In 11th grade, we take driver's ed. Everybody has to sit there through the course. You take a written test, then you get six hours with a driver who has two steering wheels. Don't conflate my talent and my skills and my ability with my privilege. Like, this isn't strength. I'm like a standard, normal, non-traditionally educated. There is nothing special about me. I guarantee you. I'm like the kid that got B's and B minus. Like, I'm nothing. I wasn't the top of my class. I wasn't the star athlete. I was just there. So I'm always just like, I'm not, there's nothing special about me at all. And don't, like, I, I feel like, I feel, I feel we share this. Like, don't idolize it. Don't, it's just, I am who, we are who we are and we're doing our best and it's okay. And yeah, I, that's one thing that really bothers me is that I, I worry sometimes that when people who were less, I, I've learned way more from uh, people who are not traditionally educated uh, around me and on, on my team who ha, who didn't get to go to school or who dropped out in fourth grade. Than, and those are the people who have been by my side more than I've got, gotten from the highly fancy schmancy educated. I, I, I really believe in that. Let's not forget who's, yeah, who's building this country. It's like... Yeah, I, I I don't. What does education actually mean when you say you're not f- formally? Educa- yeah, I didn't even know that. The VC of uh, KU told me don't, don't call yourself uneducated. Just say you are not formally educated. You are you are <laughs> you have so much experience. <laughs> that's that's how he said it, and well, I was like, okay. Yeah, I'll take why that. have we defined it as this and that and this degree? It's just like let's just do our best, and we learn the most when we're at a table talking. It's we learn more this way. That's where our education system needs to change. We don't learn by like studying from books and having somebody preach at us. We, we we need to get in spaces like this where we talk and we disagree. You and I probably disagree on the thousand things. It's okay. Of course, it's fine. It is. It is. That's the that's the whole idea of starting this podcast. And I, it, you know, I feel so happy. <sighs> oh, shit, I need to acknowledge this as well. A lot of friends have hel- asked me. To help them set up a podcast. A lot of friends. A lot of friends. I wish I had more than 24 hours. Maggie, I'm not kidding, I'm not kidding with you. I, there was a time in my life when I had all the time in the world. Now, the only thing that I'm fighting with is time. Bye. why don't you just do a podcast on how to make a podcast and then you share the link to everyone? <laughs> <laughs> we... we it's 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 more than that. Like friends ask beyond that, and, okay, okay, and okay. I just haven't been. I, <laughs> we should do that too. <laughs> then you just send them the link. This link. is everything. This is you need everything to know. you need to do, and just goddamn do it. Literally, we I send them a link of where to buy things. You know, I, and I even tell them you don't need to buy all the things that you have. Don't that, get the uh, fancy here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been I, doing this shit for such a long time that I kind of had to get like a, a couple of things right yeah, yeah but yeah. you don't have to you if you're starting start it off small, like, yeah, I, like yeah. i'm a radio guy i'm a tv guy like i kind of wanted a couple of things right but you don't need all that you know and i'm just fighting with time now like for me i think i'm not gonna lie to you like right now my shoulders hurt <laughs> after yesterday i have a ooh, uh, but do you see this? I have a tape right there. Why are your sh- <laughs> what happened? Uh, Were too many people <laughs> holding onto your arm or something? <laughs> Knees hurt. <laughs> so it, it just We're time. getting old. In the t- in my 20s, this shit never happened. And now in, no, our, in my true. 30s. We're, going, we're moving from 35 to 40. 40, right? So I think this is it. Like, you know, in 40s, it might be different. And I was just talking about this with somebody that I'm seeing right now. And we're just talking about this. And... You know, coming back to it, we're, I think I'm fighting with time now. And I think it's the same for you as well. We're fighting with time and we have limited time and we kind of want to maximize whatever we have. Or we have, a, somebody ex- try to explain it to me. We have so, just imagine, Sanjay, that you have so much time. Then the whole world open, opens up to you. Stop saying you have limited time. So I'm fighting with that right now. Hmm. That to have, I have limited time. I need to do so many different things. And I'm fighting with, no, 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 no. I have so much time. So... Hmm. Do it slowly. It's okay. Like, yeah. calm, calm down, bro. I feel that. I bet that's my battle too. I totally feel that. Yeah. Fighting with it, you know, and I'm fighting with like I'm fighting with uh, trying to trying to get inspiring stories and share that with everybody so that um, so that I'm not gonna lie to you. This, so that kids stay back, but even I'm fighting on that too. Like, okay, kids don't need to stay back in this country if if they're like done with it. You know, they're like, but you're done with it, then done with it. 
they can go wherever they need to go and uh, maybe they'll find themselves there and then maybe give back not just monetarily with with that their experience give back to this country uh, down the road you know so mm. that's a fight that i have constantly in this podcast in real life as well you know same i you know i used to be <laughs> so bitter about it I'm, no. I used to, and then yeah, I let. Then you actually meet the people, and you're like, oh, they were in an impossible situation, and and yeah, no, I I feel, and this concept of self determination is so important, right? And freedom, and yeah, I, I I'm going through the same thing with my kids. Like, oh, I want them to stay here, <laughs> but also I can't just like clip their wings and say stay here, you know, like stay. So I I feel you, yeah. Tell me more. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> we got that you're seeing so uh, We got a lot of we things. We got that. Oh, Maggie, no. <laughs> you got things blurted. <laughs> I blurted out a lot already. <laughs> no, we, we, Your shoulder's bugging you. <laughs> you're about to do a motorbike across the country. You're going to make a podcast on how to podcast. Oh, oh yeah. We, we need to do that so that we can send it to Maggie. and You're going to tell people, just, just do it. Just get out there and do it just make the thing you don't need this you don't need that oh this is my podcast now (laughs) how does it feel so what is this person's name (laughs) sure 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 hey tell me something uh i kind of wanted to ask you this and i i I was looking at a picture of you getting the cnn uh, award how Mm. how how is that moment It was beautiful, not because of the ward. Yeah. It was beautiful to see Nepal come out and vote for me <laughs> and how much love they had and pride. It was like this moment of like, oh, this country really believes in me. And when I, when I won and I, the producer was back on stage, they were like, yeah. we've never seen voter turnout like we did in Nepal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think I said, I said thank you for welcoming me here as a daughter and a sister and I had so many thank yous and uh, I think I said in that moment if you are educated and safe empowered and free you have to use your gifts and your strengths to help the rest of our human family because we are a human family Hmm. and um, I I didn't care about the award but it came with uh, resources which I could then use to build that beautiful dream school and it came with you know yeah, just support. And I, I, I'm i not one for this formalities. Like, you'll rarely see me like that and, and at conferences. And I, I get a little bit allergic to it. I just need to be doing. I'm like a karma yogi. I need to be in it. So so it, that wasn't it. It wasn't about the, the holding the award or get, get, getting the recognition or being the CNN heroes about, like, oh, mm. I can just get back to work and do my thing and have more resources and more support and yeah, more people following it. And that, and, and this sense of, I, I remember coming back and flying back to Nepal mm. and seeing the way that I was hugged and loved and put necklaces on and just feeling like we're family and we're one and I've been accepted here. It, it was like a, a stamp of acceptance after a fight and, and not understanding my identity. Mm. And do I belong here? Do I have a place? Where is my voice? I'm trying to decenter and and give voice and power to the people of Karnali, but I, it's also not my story. And I'm also not from, I, I, I've gone through a struggle of the savior complex. And I don't want to be a savior and I don't, I don't have the answers. I, I, so, so this sense of seeing people vote and being up there with my co-founder Tope and just being like, oh, there are those small moments where you look back and you're like, oh, we did something. And it was powerful. It was, it was important to me. And then when you're in government offices and you need something, <laughs> Reality. You can get a little faster. You can like yeah. move your paperwork and the stamp yeah. a little faster. Oh, sure, yeah. the CNN hero is here. And they're like, oh, 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 okay. And you get your thing. At the end of the day, I just need to get things done. Yeah. I just need to get to every single child. We need to keep our children safe and fed and nurtured and empowered and, and get to quality education. So whatever I can do to get there that's not illegal, like <laughs> – and like corrupt or like wrong, I, I just I'll, I'll like I babysat, I've dog sat, I've I've done absolutely every single thing in my power, mm. to, and, and using my privilege and my voice to help the people that I love, and I haven't always done it in the right way, but I, I've tried, and it was a good moment. It was a really good moment. 
I feel that I've been embraced. Someone said to me yesterday, mm. I didn't even know who you were until CNN Heroes. I had been working in Nepal at for that time for 10, 10 yeah, years. at that point it was like 10, 11 years. Nobody knew who we were because we weren't doing it for recognition. We weren't doing it for the awards. Those are great because they let you get back to work. But I, I'm, I'm, I like being in it. I want to be in it. You're not in Kathmandu. You were in Karnali. You were part. Maybe <clears> that too. Yeah. Does that hit you sometimes that the the center of uh, this country is here now today? And finally, like back in the day in <coughs> 2000, early 2000s, when you got here, the center, everything was here. Now, finally, it's decentralizing. How does that make you feel? Great. I mean, I, I feel conflicted. Uh, Sirket is hopping right now, by the yeah, way. Yeah. It's a provincial capital. There's a Midwestern university. There's uh, there's this new provincial hospital that's, I think, one of the biggest government-funded hospitals. Things are good. Our doctors, like you said, are it's coming in. Me, yeah. <gasps> there's so many good things that keep me going. And at the same time, I'm like looking at the trees being cut down and things being paved over and huge and you know pollution and plastic coming in. And it's a place I love where I raise my children hiking and jumping in the rivers and on the sandy river beaches. So I have this like conflicting like relationship with rapid development. Um, with Kathmandu, I am inspired by the people here. I, I. Um, yeah, it's just a different Nepal for me, right? Yeah. So I come to events like yesterday, and I'm like, whoa, <gasps> it's good for me to have a taste of that as well. So, mm. so yeah, it's we need this balance. Yeah. I, 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 I tell everyone, just find that balance, right? Like for me, if I'm too much in Karnali yeah. and I don't get that helicopter view and I never get out, things can go a little, like I'm not. I can get really stuck at times. So, so for me, coming here is great. It's healthy. So we just have to Keep, stay pliable, stay flexible, move, be with different people, interact, have those cafe conversations. Don't get so insulated that you only see the same people in the same circle and the same this and the same that. Just step out of the box. I think, yeah. It's just, when you see that your bubble's getting too small, just yeah. burst it a little and <laughs> disrupt it. And I need to do that, right? And I get to tap out and go to Canada to be with my husband. Who, and my husband's family lives on a farm. So I get that luxury. I delivered both of my babies in California. I didn't deliver at the local Carnali Hospital. Mm -hmm. I recognize that, and I had emergency births both times. I, one time I needed the NICU. Mm -hmm. I, that was a pretty privileged thing to do, to fly out of here at eight months and go deliver my baby in North America, where I'm from. So yeah. I, um, yeah, I am not one to talk about <laughs> too many things. So, so yeah, I just think, yeah, yeah. At the end of the migrant crisis, I wasn't a migrant that went to a quarantine center mm. and had to go back to India to work in the back of a restaurant or on yeah. the side of a construction site. At the end of the migrant crisis, I flew to Canada and I was with my family's cabin in the woods. And I want to call that out just right here and now. Don't, <laughs> so, don't, don't berate yourself. No, no. I, I, but like, yeah, so I, I just, um, yeah, it's good to be real about it too, though. Like, yeah, I was watching, while I was pregnant, we have these apps and we have prenatals mm -hmm. and we have... OB appointments where they do this and that and check the baby. And two weeks ago, a mother from Calico died because she hadn't had an ultrasound and she had placenta previa. And she, I, I held her baby. So we have a long way to go, right? We have a long way to go. I have court cases running of girls who have been extremely violated and we have a court system that is not supporting girls and women, and at times they're highly vulnerable. Yeah, we've got a lot to do. If people who are listening and have access can just do that one thing to help the rest of our human family, our Nepali family. That's all we can do, right? Yeah. It's a constant fight inside your brain. Inside your mind, let me let me just put it that way, Maggie. It's a, it's a constant fight of where I belong, and it's there. I have come to realize that, <laughs> and 
it's never going to go away mm-hmm. but it's going to be okay because you're going to it's not about overcoming uh, which is going to win am i nepali am i american am i from jersey am i from california am i from canada am i am i from karnali i think that fight's going to be there constantly <laughs> yeah. trust me Maggie, there are things that you have no idea <laughs> about me so you know there are, there's going to be fights that's always mm. there i think but you just have to mm, rather than battling it that, like just that's just me saying it from my yeah. heart you know no, because thanks. i can i can i can i can see it in your eyes you know that it's a, there's there's a battle um, at the end of the day again i could easily go ahead and see a line like find your happiness and <laughs> wherever you find your happiness that's where you are but that's never going to be there because I kind of have a feeling that happiness is here mm. and here. And uh, sometimes you have, you have to fight a battle between here and here, which I do all the time. Yeah. Uh, trust me, I do it all, all the time. And I think that battle is, and we're never going to win between this and this. Some days you're going to work with this, which is going to be in Carlandi, and some day you're going to win with this, which is going to be in maybe Canada or maybe anywhere else in the world. But uh, yeah. And one piece of paperwork is not going to solve that. No. <laughs> I think you've come to realize that as well now. Maybe what traveling does and getting out of the bubbles that we're in, like, it just makes us ask those questions and having those moments of recognition. Like, you could be having the shittiest day and, like, your email is unanswered and you're, I don't know, just all the nonsense, right, that we have to deal with as people in this world. I'll wake up complaining about this or that or this or that or, oh, I'm stressed about this and and then you walk out the door and there's a woman carrying like hundreds of pounds of firewood on her back and like a pile of leaves on top to feed her go. And it's those moments where I'm just like, OK, thank you. So I think when we travel and when we step outside of this ego and this self and me, 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 and what do I need to do today and what's my checklist, I think it allows for those moments of questioning, right? It allows for those moments of like, OK, keep perspective. Right. And that's what we all need. Like if we can be in spaces like yesterday in those fancy rooms with those fancy stage with your fancy suit and just take a moment and have those recognitions. That's I think that's the thing that matters. And just the gratitude of it. Like I was really grateful to be there. Yeah. I was grateful for that awesome food. I was grateful for the bathroom. I was grateful that my friend drove me home in her car after I was grateful to meet you, right? And like, yeah. so I think, yeah, I think that's because otherwise when you do get stuck in the questions of why was I born here and why was I there? And, so I do think that helps. I, it's, it's helped me. Like instead of judging it, like, right? Because we could have easily snapped into certain judgments, yeah. right? And I'm sure you had to host the whole thing. So you were in a different space, but like, you could judge it, you could say this, you could be enamored by it all, or you can just recognize like, oof, I'm in a different place now, right? So I tried to speak on behalf of Karnali, and and you tried to share your little jokes and <laughs> look cute up there. <laughs> tried my level best, tried my level best, tried my level best. <laughs> oh, be all suave and know what to say and how to say it, and yeah, it's it's... But we have to be in these different spaces, right? Yeah. We can't just be at, what's it called? Solti Hotel? Is yeah, that where we yeah, were? Yeah, yeah. We can't just be at Solti at a five-star hotel every day. We also need to go to Karnali, and we also need to go to East, and we also need to go to North, and we also need to remember the village we come from. And I think that's what our message should be to the diaspora. Just keep it in your heart. Know that these things are complicated yeah. and do the best you can. <laughs> always and you you, you got to remember who you do it for you know sometimes i push my team very hard um, uh, to make sure that we have a majority of things right because uh, uh we like the young person who's starting a podcast or that old gr- uh, grandfather who's thinking of starting a podcast because mm-hmm. he wants to see a lot of things you know will research and look for like uh, like a podcast a benchmark you know, you're getting me what I'm trying to say. He, he or she will look for a benchmark, like Nepal, Nepal ma podcast, ma te kapu you know? Mm. Now they'll Google and they'll look at, oh, Sanjay, let's look at Sanjay's. How many, how many, how many, how many shows have you done next? How many, how many have you done by now? Two, 250 plus. D- okay, 250 plus. plus. Okay, 280 plus. Oh, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so we've done 280 podcasts. They'll look at it. Okay, so 
they'll look at like certain things. Of course, we have 1,000 flaws, right? But they'll be like, okay, let's try to make it like that. Now we have a benchmark. Now we can get things wrong, right? So we always try to make sure mm-hmm. that we have a, we do it a little bit better. We do it, we try to give a little bit, I try to have the best of the best guess. Now, I don't know what best of the best means, right? Now, even I'm struggling with that all the time because I want to talk to so many different people, but I just can't, like there's limited time. Or we want to make sure that we get all our facts correct. Like we fact check right here. Uh, there might be somebody sitting here and somebody, well, somebody said like the earth was built, if, not built, like the earth was created 8,000 years ago. Uh, th- that was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I didn't have time to fact check it. And then a comedian on, the, on stage cracked a joke about that while I was there, right? And then I was like, okay, well, we got it wrong. We just couldn't fact check it on time, you know? So we'll do a better job next time. So I think it's a constant fight. And you go through that constant fight all the time uh, that I've come to realize uh, just uh, within this conversation that how can I make it slightly better? How can I maybe go ahead and have one kid you know, who we could enroll, who, who's, who could definitely go ahead and join in. I believe yeah. that's your thing. But we're raising the bar, right? The fact that people are saying, oh, I want a podcast like that. I want conversations like that. Or I want a school like that. That's the goal, right? We're ra- that's all we can do. It's like, um, look what they're doing. They're doing something different, right? So that's change in and of itself when people are watching one of the most popular emails we get is, how can we do it you do and how do we do it we get the same email uh, can you send us our codes can you send us your yes yes here we'll do everything we can right opens so here 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 and you try your best because at the end of the day you're like yeah this matters people are watching they're listening they're looking and they're raising the bar i'm a bitch of a boss i my standard i'm a <laughs> I can be, my standards are also very high. I want things done perfect. I want to be a center of excellence. I want things the best. I want you to feel a certain way. And mm. uh, it's because, I, like, and I'm competitive. I'm an athlete by my background. So it's okay. We should, we should we want more and better. And it's okay to have that edge and want that edge. And yeah, that people are looking to you. Is it very, I, I think it's awesome. Maggie, like, raise the bar, Ma- do it. Maggie, well. <laughs> Maggie, this is so good that we sat down because you're my inspiration now. You know, you, you, no, 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 no. You're my inspiration, and so, so I thought. Well, hundred, at least I forget about hundred. The one person who is listening to this right now, you're the inspiration, and uh, I've done z- probably like just to put in metrics into it, zero point one percent of what you've it's achieved so far. No, no, no. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I agree with you and disagree with you on this. We were 0.1 percent, and so, you know we we're going to strive to learn from you every single day and learn from what you've achieved and try to try to try to you know grasp in uh, a lot of things, a lot of all the positivity that you have. And thank you so much for coming here. And thank I've you. learned a lot, and uh, we'll try to do that 0.2 percent, and we'll try <laughs> to get to 0.2, and uh, you know just just try to learn more from you. Mm, Always. Thanks. Likewise. Yeah, and then when we come down to Surkhet, Dalbat's there. <laughs> Dalbat Tarkiri, Dalbat Power. <laughs> uh, to everybody watching right now, uh, make sure that you, uh, I really I haven't followed you on Instagram, so I'll do that right away. A uh, Blink now on Instagram, so I'll do that right away. Uh, X, make sure that you show everything. Uh, book, uh, where can they get it? Like, where all government do prints, people? It's being printed as we speak. They're arriving today. I'm going to get you an early reader. Um, and they'll be at every single bookstore, Pilgrims, Patton, uh, Coyote's Cove. Uh, yeah, I think there's some online vendors that will carry it. Just between the mountain and the sky, Maggie Doyne, you'll find it. And uh, we'll be all over Insta. I'm trying, I'm sure, like, just trying to sell it. So. <laughs> hey, you, you are a free soul and uh, you've got a friend for life. All right, oh, both of us. Same. You're a friend for life. All right. I'm Middle bye. <laughs> oh. Sanjay bye. <laughs> Sanjay bye. <laughs> not, not a lot yeah, of months. I'm still DD to you, so you be careful. Now I'm your DD. I get to meet the girl. <laughs> tell, obviously. Uh, uh, <laughs> let's not go into that. Let's not go into that, my friend. Let's not go into that. And uh, invite uh, Jeremy anytime. And uh, again, I'd love to invite both of you guys for. We'll do dinner, we'll plan a dinner, and then definitely show the studio as well. Yeah, and if we can yeah, help out in yeah. Any way, oh, it'll it. be fun. Let's all get together. And all right. 
keep hanging out and I'll host you in Cirquette and vice versa. This is a beautiful studio. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep having the hard conversations. Seriously. Which I, which I'm Didi I, now. I get to boss you around. Uh, Didi gets to boss you around. Didi always gets to boss <laughs> me around. And even in education, like, you know, anytime, anything. Like like I said, we're, we're just, we're the small little tree that uh, needs to um, grow. And, uh, you know, and we'll learn a lot from you in the coming years. And uh, we'll, try to, we'll try to soak in all the good uh, sunshine that you have to go ahead and share with everybody. Thank and, you. Uh, thank mm-hmm. you very much, Maggie. Keep going. Wow. Thank you. Hey, this is, again, we've done so many podcasts, and uh, again, uh, I do not like saying it, but uh, this, is, this, this is awesome. All right. <laughs> this is awesome. Thank you, Maggie. Yay! <laughs>